All right, and we are back. Hey, after being bitten by a radioactive bird, somewhat mannered Sea Tudhill was compelled, nay, possessed, to become Kinius, the Sky Dude. This is actually episode 140. I've had to hurry back to my computer and I didn't get any fresh cover art made for this episode. So I'm sorry about that. I'll try to fix that after the show, but this is episode 130 and we're still following the route of Alexander, but now we're down in Egypt. And we need to go all the way back up to a place called Granic uh, Galgamela. And now Alexander is going to get into a huge fight with Darius III, who's over here with his army actually terraforming all the land to be in favor of his troops to fight Alexander. It's like he's creating War World. So him and all of his forces are, are going to be up here. And again, they're going to be terraforming. I don't know that I'm in the exact spot. That should be as close to the, the spot where historically they believe that it took place. Right in here. So Darius and his men are planning all their stuff here. I guess he's got all men out there leveling the fields, pulling all the rocks up so that the horses can do better and putting obstacles here and setting up things there and trying to, again, use the landscape to his advantage so that he isn't beaten once more by Alexander the Great. They fought already at Issus and he got his rear end handed to him. Not only that, he lost his wife, he lost his family, he had a bunch of gold with him to pay for the war, lost all that, and had to retreat up here to wait for Alexander to come back and try to depose him. Now, I suppose Alexander could have immediately gone down into Baghdad and started going after the capital cities over here, but he still has Darius to deal with, and either he's going to let him sneak in behind and flank him, or he's got to deal with him directly. Um... But that seems the way it's gone, the way that it's gone. Now, also, that's seven. We're looking at 875 miles at the moment. He's just traveled all the way from up here. All the way over here. Then all the way down here to Egypt. And now he's got to travel all the way back. And the last time uh, we were watching the Kings and Generals channel, they said after he left Memphis, Memphis, home of Elvis, uh, not that Memphis, this Memphis down here in Egypt. So after he went out and got pulled all his good stuff, he's really hyped up right now. He cruised down here and checked out Memphis in Egypt. And then he started making his way back to Cairo because I doubt he would have taken a cut across the desert that way. Not at all. There's no way he's going to be wanting to cross desert. So let's at least put him back up here. Okay. So we're still looking at 903 miles that Alexander's got to walk back now. And supposedly he came back to Tyre first. Which was an amazing story. It This is unbelievable what he did here unbelievable he he really was great i mean the accomplishment of what he did here this used to be an island over on this side right here there used to be nothing connecting this to the mainland this is all artificial this whole little neck unit here alexander built this main road you see the main road coming th through here Alexander the Great did this. This is still his causeway. And then he had it widened. And then over time, it's continued to widen. But yeah, this used to be an island, and he made they made Alexander so mad that he built that road to them just to go over there to kick their asses. And he did, and it was horrible for them. But anyway, he's going to be making his way back here first so we'll go ahead and uh i really don't want to waste your time by flying 900 miles tonight to get to where we're going so as long as you have the coordinates 
we'll go ahead and let's go ahead and spawn at Memphis and fly around Memphis a little bit. And, oh, we've got to do this one. We've got to go to Ballback. It's not recorded uh, in popular stories and conquests that he went here, but I'm like, how could he not go to Ballback? That makes no sense. Why would Alexander the Great do all these trips and then not go here? That makes no sense to me. So I did some digging and I found out, sure enough, he did go here. And there's a, a real important reason why he went here and that was to see a certain structure. And hopefully we can find it and I'll be able to zero in on exactly where it's at. Maybe there. No. Either way, we'll find it. Let's get the show on the road, though. Let's get down back to Memphis and fly this thing. I've got the ornithopter. Yeah, why not? We'll just be using it for a minute anyway. Hope you're having a wonderful night. Let me grab my coffee while we got a moment. Take a sip of coffee and try to calm down. I had to rush back to my seat tonight. I was I wasn't even gonna I wasn't I didn't even think I was going to make it. Okay. the kings and generals channel ready like what am i looking at it is the dune ornithopter from the dune uh, the dune movies whoops I forgot which buttons to push to put the wings back out. Yeah, you don't want to do that too often. Let's try that again. I'm guessing this is the Nile right here, and this is Memphis, Egypt, as it looks within the last 10 years. I can't control it from out here, really. Gotta be in this. Something down here. I know there's some pyramids around here, hidden back along the Nile. Bent pyramids, red pyramids. a gold deposit this colored ground is usually I think associated with gold could be wrong there's some pyramids over there
Well, I thought it was going to be a heck of a lot bigger than than it is. What's going on here? Don't freeze. Don't don't crash into the pyramid. Please don't crash into the pyramid. Freezing. These are dinky. I thought these were much bigger. Yeah, I thought these things were at least the size of the other ones up north. Nah, not at all. They definitely had a bunch of stuff laid out over there. Nice and gridded over there. That one too. I thought these pyramids were much larger. I was wrong. Pardon any stuttering, I've turned up the graphics as high as I can get it for blowing up the machine to try to provide you the best looking graphics I can on this these particular live streams, so I apologize. So yeah, it's it's I've got it pushed too hard, it's not handling anything smooth. Let me turn things down a little bit. If you'd like to help me get more quickly into a new computer, actually I don't know that it's gonna help me get into it any quicker. Because I'm going to wait till Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024 comes out before I buy. But if you'd like to help me get a new computer so I can bring you better and better and better mind-boggling graphics for this one and the next iteration, please like and subscribe. Even just a like a helps so much. So a subscription, it lets Google know, hey, this guy's all right. Hook him up with some quality ads, you know, for people to watch replays. So that... Uh, I can make a buck or two. All right. There's the pyramid of Dozier. Oh yeah, lower the graphics so we don't come in and crash. Okay, we don't need to bring the terrain. Let's bring it back to about a hundred or, you know, a little better. Okay, we don't need the grass and bushes, although that'd be really cool. I would love to have this up, but it's gonna kill us. Trees. Turn down to at least medium. Buildings, keep it high. And let's turn the buildings up to ultra. Let's put a little power there. Hopefully, now, in finagling that kind of stuff, she's not so unstable. All right, it's coming for a landing. Oh, I did it again. Tricky. Okay, it's that one, that button. Abu Sir. Yeah, these were all dinky. I thought these were much bigger. Oh, I wish I had a better view. I want to land on the thing. Oh, we're clipping our wings on it. Let's try 
tricky. Ah. We did it! Oh, no, get back down. Oh, no. When I, uh, when I clicked that, it lifted off again. Oh, but you saw it. It's recorded. We did it. We landed on the pyramid of Dozier. You can see, looking at the land, the engravings in the land, this was a huge city. There's so much in Egypt that we still don't know about. I mean, really, everywhere you look on the ground, there was something there. Look at all these ancient si ancient cities that are just they're just etchings in the ground at this point. But you you know the stuff was there. All right, we're back up to Giza. Yeah. If you missed the show earlier, I'll let me just do a quick flyby of the pyramids and the Sphinx. Or... We're over here. I forgot to put our gear down. There's the Sphinx out ahead of us. I want to get back to you that I want. That's the view that I want. Picking up a bit of dust. And that way we learned way over there at the coast is Alexandria, and that is humongous too. I mean, this place is huge. As you can imagine, this is, uh, Alexandria is huge also. So let's get a little bit of a feel for... How big this place is. Fly across Cairo. This has no autopilot. That's not that big of a deal. If I can get us a better view.
There is supposedly what they used to call the King's Road, and I guess if you follow a straight line from, like, the Sphinx, they call it the King's Road. In antiquity, this King's Road was supposed supposedly went all the way out to Mesopotamia, all the way out to the ancient cities. One road that you could take all the way from there, all the way to here. So I should have thought about that when we were when we took off from the Sphinx is to fly just straight and see what kind of roads we can still see uh, as part of the old King's Road. Yeah, man, a straight shot pretty much all the way through all the land straight over to uh, Babylon, or I think maybe Sumer and Ur, the places like that. But yeah, look at how far it stretches out there. You know, I would love to visit all this stuff if it just wasn't so darn scary these days. There's too many hostilities right at the moment with this whole part of the world still. Still. I feel like a jart. Remember that game of jarts for your yard? I'm a jart. Using my thrusters afterburner. Shoot myself into the air like a jart. Where in the yard are we going to land? And I can also put it into glide mode. But you lose a lot of airspeed, you know, but still, you can glide. But if you look over at the left, just how much airspeed we're losing. There's no trim on this thing at this time. It's pretty even. 247, 247 knots. It's slower percent. Slower deceleration, I'd say. So, yeah. All right, then. Back to... We're not going to do it. I'm not going to go all the way back out to... Uh higher just know that he did he went all the way back there and before we teleport ourselves to where we need to be let's go ahead and find out what the uh the kings and generals channel had to say on uh, let's see where they pick it up at anyway let me go ahead and turn this off over here switch back over Turn off my auto scene switcher. And let's see where they pick it up at. We might have to just pause and but let, anyway, let's let's find out anyway. It might play some commercials, so for Alexander the Great's legendary campaign against Darius III of the Achaemenid Empire, the winter of 332 to 331 was the calm before the storm. During that time, the Macedonian army had what amounted to a holiday in the gentle lands adjacent to the River Nile. But that holiday but was that's now over. Gone. As the mountain snows thawed and the spring began, two of the greatest armies of the age were on the march. Alexander's force was smaller, but had proven itself supreme multiple times in the realms of discipline, technology, and command. 
Darius's newly raised Imperial army was massive, its warriors drawn from the seemingly endless reserves of his continent-spanning empire. Persia was about to face off for one last time against Macedon at the Great Battle of Gorgamela in 331. Having better gear makes a big difference in the chaos of an ancient battle, but it still helps out today, where those with the most security are least at risk in the chaos of the internet. Oh, this is an app. It's time for a bit of new tech from our sponsor, NordVPN. <laughs> Normally, you can use NordVPN elves, although it blocks web corner of the Nord window and engage the every potential Alexander the his apocal triumph at Isis two years earlier Alexander had been methodically reducing every potential center of resistance in the western part of the Achaemenid Empire yep. Syria had been secured and administered followed by Phoenicia Palestine and the jewel in Persia's crown Egypt but as spring of 331 BC arrived it was once more time to move on this time into Persia's imperial heartland the advance would be risky. Disconcerting news was even now arriving from Greece concerning Agassiz's revolt. All the king could feasibly do at this point without abandoning everything he had accomplished Get mad. was to send a great fleet of 100 ships to aid any harbor supporting the Macedonian cause. Apart from that, putting down the Greek rebels would be left to Antipater and the men under his command. With that considered, Alexander again turned east where Darius and a colossal Persian army were waiting for him. Following one final bout of administrative fine-tuning, the king marched his army to Thapsicus, a major link between Syria and Mesopotamia. He arrived between July and August, but an advance force under Hephaestion had already been present for some time, and managed to construct two pontoon bridges over the Euphrates ready for the army's use. As a sign of the Macedonian engineer's skill, these bridges lacked a final stretch on the far bank, preventing any enemy force from effectively using them, and this proved to be a wise <laughs> Observing the invaders crossing from a safe distance was a force of 3,000 Persian cavalry outriders, commanded by one of Darius's satraps, Mazaeus. Arian seems to imply that Mazaeus's horsemen were supposed to stop the crossing of Alexander's vastly superior army, but it is more probable that Darius simply required intelligence as to what the Macedonians were doing. There was realistically no chance for Mazaeus to prevent the crossing by himself. Having learned from previous defeats, Darius III had come up with a plan. I have a cunning plan. Another invasion force, famously including 10,000 Greek mercenaries, had marched directly down the east bank of the Euphrates with the aim of taking Babylon, as the Persians believed Alexander, notoriously bold as he was, would. In that previous clash, the invaders had arrived on a wide, cavalry-friendly plain known as Conexa and were stopped in their tracks. Darius hoped to repeat that feat at the same place, further relying on the blistering Mesopotamian sun and scorched earth tactics to deny the Macedonians food, fodder, and comfort. But while this cunning plan took Alexander's <laughs> directness into account, it did not account for the king's unpredictability. As a lover of Hellenic works, he too was educated in Xenophon's Anabasis. Therefore, upon crossing the Euphrates, Alexander struck northeast across the Mesopotamian plain, beelining Psych! to the other great river, Tigris. Not only did this completely derail Darius's preparations, but the cooler northern temperatures would be better for the Macedonian army. Upon seeing Alexander's move north, Mazaeus rode hurriedly to inform his master in Babylon. Ascension WoW is a standalone World of Warcraft private server that reimagines WoW in a brand new way. Uh -oh. Instead of choosing a classic character select, you'll instead take up the mantle of hero. Oh, really? Match spells and talent. I'll probably get a copyright strike for playing this too. To the credit of the great king and his commanders, this unexpected turn of events did not paralyze Persian preparations, and a strategic pivot was quickly made. Paralyze the Persian army would move north towards Arbella and confront Alexander somewhere on the Tigris. All the while, Mazaeus would venture upriver, dispatching a tightly knit web of scouting forces to keep an eye on the Macedonian monarch. By the time Alexander got near, Darius's army would be ready and waiting. Meanwhile, Alexander himself was still crossing the arid Mesopotamian plain, 
capturing a few of Mazaeus's scouts in the process. It was from these captives that the Macedonians learned, somewhat vaguely, that the main Persian army had taken up a position on the Tigris and was set to throw the Macedonians back if they attempted to ford the river. Moreover, estimates of the sheer size of Darius's massive army were also obtained. If Arian is to be believed, such speculation simply made Alexander desire a confrontation all the more rapidly. Upon finally arriving at the upper reaches of the Tigris in mid-September, the Macedonian king and his army found neither Darius nor his 100,000-plus men. Faulty or deceptive intelligence from the captured scout, it seemed. Still, deprived of his immediate fight, this did allow the Macedonians to cross to the far bank relatively easily, after which they were given a well-deserved rest before moving on. At about the same time, Darius, vaguely aware of where Alexander was, reached Arbella. The two armies, now on the same side of the Tigris, were getting perilously close to one another. While Alexander continued pressing on with the river on his right and the mountains on his left, Darius managed to find a perfect replacement battlefield for the great plain of Conexa near the small village of Gorgamela. He marched his troops up and immediately set laborers to work, okay. flattening hills, clearing rocks and trees, and employing every possible measure to make the plain as flat as possible. The great king was so distracted by this that he failed to take the low hills three miles west. En route, Alexander had... All right, let's pause right there. Okay, so Darius is staging, and like I said, he was he had spent all that time getting everything ready down near Babylon, doing the same thing. And so he hurried up over here, and now he's starting to do the same thing. He's trying to minor quickly get his people surveying the land and getting it all terraformed so that it is better for him, which is super smart. I mean, if you've got 100,000 men standing around, yeah. Go clear all the rocks. Go make it good for the horses. Go do this. Go add the wood and go build some stuff over here. Getting it whatever kind of forces you can get in. But what we want to do now is we want to get the location of Galgamela, okay? And I believe that is right here. Let me copy the uh, the link. Okay, let's come back out to the main menu. I love this. If you have the coordinates, I, I hadn't, I didn't know this in the past. And I'm dumb. I really should have thought about it more. And then I stumbled across somebody going, hey, here's how you use coordinates to find any place you want in the world. And you don't have to hunt. And I've been doing a lot of hunting. Okay, so you just paste in. You don't want the geo part. Well, it looks like it still works. Still worked. Okay. Now click this. Oh, no. Okay, so you don't want the you don't want the geo part. It seems to throw it off. So let's see what happens if when I remove the geo semicolon. There. Yes. Yes. All right. There's the river. Arbella. Is that right. Yeah, that seems like the right spot. Let me double check. I'm not kind of seeing the same formations. And, you know, it may not be perfect, but... saying this is it but they made it look like he crossed other rivers down here I mean the the, the terrain looks a little bit weird oh that's that Sinai well, let me go for Arbella okay one moment let me pull up Arbella A R B E L A. Herbal. Called Herbal today. Arbella. Greco Roman, Herbal, Kurdistan, Iraq.
Do do Jordan, Herbal Kurdistan region, Iraq. Okay, get those coordinates. Plug those in. See what we get. If if it's right, it it should be south of where we. Now we're lost. Wow, look at how pretty this place is. Wow, look at the design on all this. So he's north of here. They said he left Arbella and he went north. Wow, what a city. And he was falling. He crossed a river here and then he crosses another one. This looks like the area. Uh hmm. This kind of looks like the area, right? Because he crosses another one. This looks like it. Everything looks like it at this point to me. Because he crossed this, right? And then he crossed into here. Let me just try it. Uh... Do double check. Battle of Galgamela. Okay, close. Yes. Well, this is where, again, where Wiki says. So I guess it could be these little streams. They seemed like rivers in the area. And then he said he was clearing all this up here, and here's this mountain range. He says Alexander's coming around here. And he said he was so busy with getting this area staged. Okay, here's the two, the split. Right? Here's the split, here's the split here. So it came up through here. He's staging here on this side. Or he's in here, and then he's getting this all set up for the battle. And he said, and then they said he wasn't paying attention this way. I wonder who I thought he'd come if he would come around this way, come up through here. I don't know what he was expecting. All right, well, let's put ourselves here at the northern end of this. And we'll fly in and get back to the general's page. So 100,000 men plus. Possibly more. Earlier at Isis, I think they said it could have been up to 600,000. I can't imagine now that he's coming in with a lesser force. Or I've still got shit wrong, and he crossed here, and he's staging here, and Alexander's coming in through here. I don't know. But since they're putting it over here, let's go there. Okay, let's just do this. Oh, you're not even seeing what I've been talking about. I'm trying to stage us. Okay, there's two mountain ranges. Counters with Persian cavalry forces under Mazay. All right, there's this strip. Yes, but there's this strip here that I'm seeing, and then there's this strip here. So I'm spawning us in here, I believe. Hope you can see my mouse spinning around. 
So Darius again, I've got him. Yeah, this is where I put us. I'd put him coming in over here. And we should be spawning right here. Okay, there's one ridge of mountains there. Looking down. Um erp, 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 the other down. Other down. Yeah. Speed up the drone camera all the way. Maximum speed, Scotty. Alright. So the way it looks on the map that generals, kings and generals are gonna show is this view here. Start pulling back. And this way a little bit. Start to turn this way. I can imagine that they had stuff at the top of these hills. Scouting and everything. Somebody was trying to make a road right in the middle. Okay, and then there's this range of mountains right here down okay so the kings and generals map the way that they're going to show the army uh the battle here is beyond that range and darius has come in over here crossing these rivers to get into The more green areas straight ahead of us. It says so it says Zbat Airport up ahead. I believe he's in there. So now he's coming down in here and he's starting to get his men. Whoops. Working on all this territory. And setting up this. And they said and we'll pick up here where he says he didn't expect Alexander to come in at that end. So, before I start it up again, just take a moment to, uh, I love just pondering the landscape because you don't know if any of this stuff is modern when you look at the ground. Or these are actually remnants. In some places in the world, there's been no construction since Alexander the Great, basically. And when you come through these places and you start looking at every single, like, uh, any of these. And again, he's got 100,000 or more men with him. How many of these places in antiquity were places where these are all camps? Established uh, routes for, you know, uh, your entourage, their people. Because you've got to support all those people. You don't know how long you're going to be there, if it's going to be a standoff for a long time, or... So you've got to have everything in place logistically. What is that? It's like they carved a perfect square in the ground for water. That It almost looks like a... A water. I don't know, but Mother Nature doesn't really do that. Only man is going to make a perfect square like that. So, what is that? Yeah, and I can't imagine he'd want to put his people all out in that crap. But there still would have been... they still You still would have had to move your men around checking everything. They have built an airport right here. That's cool. Because this is it, man. Yeah, this is this is the place. 
would have been safe to have a lot of your stuff back here. Your supply train, things like that. That's what I'm talking about. Your supply line. Speaking of supply lines, uh, we've been playing Dungeons and Dragons again, tabletop, with old friends who are trying to teach their kids how to play now. And over the years, playing D and D, you know, yo, the encumbrance. If you're dealing with DMs who deal with encumbrance. Uh, so for years now, whenever I play, I try to hire a bunch of NPCs or include a bunch of NPCs to use as, as a supply train, usually hiring a bunch of orphans and people are like, oh my God, you hire orphans. Yeah. But the goal of supply train supply train is, is, you know, they're all excellent at hiding and they're all, they don't engage. They stay out of sight. They're good at hiding. They're good at illusions. They're good at people covering them. Like little hobbits and stuff. And they're never supposed to engage. And they're all, always supposed to be far enough back, but just far enough back to where I need to call somebody up to come grab something. Or hang out at a cave entrance or do whatever. Having a supply chain with carts and everything behind your party just allows you to take everything. It makes some things so much nicer. All right, back. And that's enough messing around with that. Looked around. Let's get back to the action. Which they were easily put to flight. Further prisoners taken in these engagements revealed that Darius's massive army was at Gorgomela, by that point only around 10 miles away. Further investigation uncovered the ground leveling operations and made Alexander realize that Darius didn't intend to move from his pre selected battlefield, allowing him to encamp and give his men another substantial rest before the climactic battle. During this short lull, the Persians utilized infiltration and assassination tactics, attempting to turn the Greek soldiers against Alexander with promises of gold and other good things. One of these letters was intercepted, and the king debated reading it aloud before the Greeks to emphasize his trust in them. He was deterred from doing so by the ever-cautious Parmenian, who reasoned that avarice recognized nothing as a crime, not even the murder of a king. Instead, the letter was suppressed and the camp fortified. While most of the army recuperated in camp, Alexander assembled a strong cavalry escort and went to personally scout both the battlefield terrain and Darius's army. When he crested the hill overlooking it, Peter Green suggests that the Macedonian king might have second-guessed his earlier bravado about facing the Persians so brazenly. So... Where we're looking right now, looking straight down, this is a, this is the encampment. This is the location of the encampment he's talking about. And Alexander is riding this way, and he's looking for a low point in this mountain range. So that he can get a good look at things. And according to this, he's right in this area. Right along here. Alright. And so now he's looking. Out this way. According to the map, it shows he's looking a little bit south. So they triggered it my way. And they said, here he's looking out and he's able to see Darius staging all of his people out here. He says he realizes that he's not going to leave his spot. He's got pe people doing all kinds of stuff out here. And I imagine, I would imagine that if we had a vantage point and we saw that he wasn't going to move, we'd just watch what he's doing. For a little while if we had the opportunity 
you know, and they said he was leveling terrain in certain places, and in other stories, he's, you know, chopping down trees and making fortifications and creating ditches. And so we're going to find out where he decides to, and where to continue and meet him at this point. All right, let's go back up in the air a little bit and zoom out. Skirt in the mountain and his camp again is right over here. All right, so. That should be right now exactly what where we're at. We should be approximately, well, back here a little bit. Camp, what the camp is. For what he saw was an army larger even than that he had faced at Issus. More than that, it seemed far superior in armament and skill, possessing a large quantity of fearsome Eastern cavalry. That night, Alexander sat awake in his tent for hours on end, analyzing the potential of each Persian unit and considering the potential damage they might inflict. Right, right. The tactics he could use to gain victory. At some point, Parmenian arrived and suggested that a night attack be carried out. But Alexander stated that he would not demean victory by stealing victory like a thief. Alexander must defeat his enemies openly and honestly. But even Arian, who usually gushes with praise over the Macedonian king, found it likely that this haughty response was just a smokescreen. He believed instead that these lofty words probably indicated confidence in danger rather than vanity. Rather than the morality of victory, refusal to engage in an incredibly risky, potentially catastrophic night attack was instead simply a sound tactical decision. Pitched battles had worked wonders thus far, and so there was no need to gamble everything in the dark. This proved to be a shrewd decision indeed. While the Macedonian army was resting in preparation for the coming battle, Darius's troops, lacking a camp with fortifications, were actually drawn up in full battle order throughout the night in fear of any surprise assault by the enemy. Not only did the consequential lack of sleep exhaust the vast array of Achaemenid warriors, but waiting hour after hour with nothing to show for it demoralized the Persians greatly, sapping their spirit. Back in the secure Macedonian camp, Alexander at last crossed the T's and dotted the I's of his intricate battle plan, and then simply went to sleep in the early morning hours. When the sun rose above the horizon on the morning of the great Battle of Gorgamela, Alexander did not rise with it. Instead, unconcerned by the gravity of the occasion, he slept. On their own volition, the various battalions had breakfast and assembled for battle. I'm Greg. I'm Gab. Greg. And we're the founders of Magic Spoon. Uh, you know, I'd like to be able to play their stuff. I'll let it run so that they get their, um, their ad revenue. I shouldn't be so stingy on skipping their commercials when they play, but I've got to turn it off because we played the, uh, Fallout commercial from Amazon Prime and it flagged it as a copyright violation, which is dumb. It's an, it's a commercial. You want people to talk about your commercial and talk about, as I did about going to watch that program and I really want to see it like right now it's playing in uh, on the other screen and it's uh, the fallout commercial and it sucks because I'd really like to play it for you and talk about it for a minute instead I have to skip it like a fool and get back to this Armenian, probably rolling his eyes a little, go and rouse the king from his slumber. No doubt curious as to just how the king was able to sleep so soundly when the largest army ever seen was right there over the hill, Parmenian asked him. Alexander simply responded by saying that he had indeed been worried when the Persians had been retreating and laying waste to the line of march. But now that pitched battle was on the cards, by Heracles he has done exactly what I wanted. All right, it said, see, th that's the thing that I don't get right there. He determined that 
the battle was fixed. That Darius was not going to move, and that all he had his troops doing, besides being in formation, which, again, that's contradicting to what he, the previous statement, that he had him hurriedly out there working on getting the landscape set up properly. And that because of that, he wasn't expecting, he was expecting Alexander from kind of the south the way he's coming, but he wasn't expecting him to, to take the time to come around through the north. All right. So that's why it seems to me that Alexander's not concerned. Because if he was worth his salt, him and his people that were standing up on that hill where we just were, looking at everything, it's like, okay, these guys are building this over here, and he's got these guys, these troops staged here, and you can see that they're leveling this out, and they're digging ditches over here and over here, and if you were taking good notes, you could comfortably go back to your... I know that they're stressed out, because anytime a scout could see them, and at any given moment. But... Provided that, again, nothing bad happens, that they're occupied with doing what they're doing. That there really is no hurry. That you can go back, he thought about it all night long, and thought about it, and thought about it. And, um... Do, 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 and, you know, so, it's cool. Chill out, relax. We're good. Get some rest, make sure you're all rested up, right? Get some food been methodically reducing every potential Oops. center of resistance. I went way too far. Two pontoon bridges. Oh my gosh, I was went. Educated in Xenophon, flattening hills, clearing in camp. Alexander assembled a strong cavalry escort and went to personally scout both the battlefield terrain and Darius's army. When he crested the hill overlooking it, Peter Green suggests that the Macedonian king might have second guessed some eastern cavalry arrived and suggested just a smokescreen. He believed in full battle order throughout the night. He slept on their own volition. Exactly what I wanted. Not All right. long later, Alexander and his army strode onto the Gorgomela plain in battle ready formation. Finally, the Macedonian king and his Persian counterpart were face to face once more, and the great battle for Asia was about to begin. All right. All right, Alexander. So Alexander came down off the hill, went back to his camp. Down in here. Reading Herodotus' version of history is a trip when he talks about troops moving around he's always there's this phrase that comes up over and over and it's always captivated me and my friends uh friends that when i've talked about him we all seem to have been fixated on uh, a particular phrase and meeting each other and talking about it we're always stunned that each one of us knew you know we're fixated by the phrase and that is they drank the river dry he says that a lot. So as these armies are moving around, he's constantly talking about, and when they set up camp over the next whatever, how many days that they were there, they drank the river dry. It's crazy. Okay, so Alexander crept around. He still has plenty of cover all the way to the northern. It, it flattens out so much here, but there's still enough elevation on this side. It's like a little ramp area. So as long as your troops are anywhere below the crest of this line right here, they don't see you. So all of a sudden, Alexander goes, and he starts sliding out here. Okay. Look at all these marks in the ground.
is it possible that some of these markings in the ground and in the terrain are from the activity of that battle? I would, th I would think so. That's how they end up finding a lot of things these days. You know, old, uh, old Roman ruins, etc., etc. They either use the sonar, but usually they get up high enough in the air, like where we are, and they just look at what's still there and whatever still sticks out. That's crazy. Over to Darius' side over here. Not so much to read now, and then so much now farmland throughout here, but you still see some weird places like this. You can still make out some of, like, heavy traffic. You know, could this have been a temporary fort area? I don't know, you know, but, I mean, it's such an anomaly that you have to ask, what is this? It's up just enough that, you know, high enough, and it seems to have had a wall or something, a trench or something around it. All right. Back up into the air and look, same with that area right there. All right, let's come back to the northern side. Spin the camera around and get back to the battle uh, in here. Battle, battle's actually turned the other way. My bad. Battle actually is set up. We we'll go back to the other screen looking in this direction. Or kind of looking at it sideways. We'll imagine that's the middle of the field. And then go back over here. But this clash was not to be the walkover the Macedonians might have expected after their winter of luxury. Darius's army was so massive that its flanks extended beyond Alexander's by a significant margin, and outflanking was virtually assured. The Persian left and right wings were commanded by Bessus and Mazaeus. Oh my gosh while the great king Darius III himself was stationed in the center. On the left, Bessus commanded thousands of cavalry from his own satrapy of Bactria, together with Sogdians and Arachosians. Additional mounted strength was drawn from the nomadic peoples beyond Persia's northern frontier, who were in military alliance with the empire, such as the Sake and Dahe Scythians fighting as cataphracts or horse archers. On the right, Mazaeus had Syrians, Mesopotamians, and Medes under his leadership, flanked towards the center by Parthian and even more Sake cavalry. Tapirians, Hyrcanians, Albanians, and Sacassinians from the Caucasus and the areas around the Caspian Sea formed the link between the right and center. The vanguard of Mazaeus's wing was composed of Armenian and Cappadocian riders. Mixed Persian infantry and Greek mercenaries formed Darius's center, together with the king's personal cavalry, immortals, and the Indian cavalry. Two more exotic units made their debut in this massive clash. First were the great king's 200 scythed chariots, somewhat experimental shock vehicles with blades on their wheels tailored to break apart the fearsome Macedonian phalanx. 
100 of these chariots were drawn up just to the right of Bessus's Bactrians, and 50 each in front of the Indians and next to Mazaeus's Armenians. 15 majestic elephants accompanied the Indian contingent. All in all, the Persian army at Gorgamela consisted of between 100,000 and 150,000 troops, 30 to 40,000 of which were cavalry. Alexander's army of around 40,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry opposed this gargantuan force. On the surface, its units were drawn up as they usually were. Phalanx battalions made the solid center. Parmenian and his allied Thessalian cavalry stood guard on the left, while Alexander, the companion cavalry, and the king's usual Agrianes, Archer and Hypaspist strike force prepared to smash the enemy army on the right. But there were a few notable differences designed by the king for precisely this occasion. Both the Macedonian left and right flank guards were angled inward in order to better withstand a Persian encirclement attack. The second line of 7,000 Greek hoplite infantry was also arrayed behind the first Macedonian line with orders to turn and face any attempt at encirclement by the enemy. Hopefully, twisting the flanks as he had and deploying such a reserve would hold the Achaemenid cavalry off until the battle was won. Confident in his army's supreme discipline and fully prepared to exploit Darius's plan, Alexander ordered his entire line to gradually shift to the right. Simultaneously, the king personally took his right wing and began an oblique advance as though aiming to outflank the Persian line with his numerically inferior forces. At once reacting to this unexpected maneuver, Bessus flexed his strength by stretching his cavalry even further out, always keeping outside of the Macedonians. This in turn dragged units away from the Persian center. All of a sudden, it became obvious to the Achaemenid leadership that by edging his army to the right, Alexander was attempting to move the battle away from the leveled plain, therefore rendering much of Darius's long-planned strategy null and void. Regardless of his lacking numbers, Alexander continued drifting right until he was just short of the cleared zone. Anxious to avoid fighting on the rough ground, Bessus finally committed his wing by launching a direct charge against the Macedonian right. This commitment was precisely the move Alexander had been attempting to provoke. Meet Renewal by Anderson, a full-service window and door installer that offers dun, 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 dun. features and energy efficiency. Okay, so back over here real quick. Uh, so Alexander, out here, again, he's come up over that ridge, staged over here. We're probably a lot, much, a lot farther back than I have us. Either way, he is now going to start pulling his wing back this way and pulling them to the, uh, to the right over here. Now, again, we don't know. I don't know exactly where he would have done that. He said he didn't want to get caught up in the, the rough terrain. Okay. So it could have been back, far back as over there. But either way, it could have, it, it looks like there was a little gully. like Something like this down in there. Oops. Yeah, and the other. My keys are reversed on this. Like in here. Kind of that little notch. Which I wouldn't want to be on the downside of a charging army and give them any sort of upper ground advantage, but he says that's just what he wanted them to do. So no matter what, they're now going to engage him. Isn't it wonderful? I mean, back then, kings and the people that are causing everybody to fight, they're the first ones out there in the fight. And in every case, Alexander's always been the first one. You know, leads by example, not from Washington. If they had to do that, they, they wouldn't be waging war so much. Okay. So let's go back over here. Avoid fighting on the rough ground, Bessus finally committed his wing by launching a direct charge against the Macedonian right. This commitment was precisely the move Alexander had been attempting to provoke. 
as his companion cavalry joined battle with the ferocious Sake Bactrian horse that formed Bessus' vanguard, the Macedonian king fed additional units into the fray from deeper on his flank. Naturally, Bessus responded by committing the majority of his strength with the hope of crushing Alexander and rolling up his army. As this engagement was progressing on the Macedonian right, Darius III believed that the moment had come to wipe out this troublesome invader from the west once and for all. On the other Persian flank, Mazaeus launched an overwhelming cavalry assault against the ever stalwart Parmenian, who was, as always, desperately outnumbered. All across the line, Persian scythed chariots, 200 of them, barreled forwards in an all out rush to smash the Macedonian phalanx. So something we've learned about, again, I when we first started this journey, and I, I, I took us across the Hellespont where his people came across, I said, forgive me, I haven't had the time with the information yet to absorb everybody that's involved in this campaign. And at that time I said, I don't fully know, I don't know all the names of his generals, I know Ptolemy. And he's the only one. And so since we've been coming down and running these, I, I definitely, you know, now know that Parmenian is another guy in the campaign. And Parmenian, as they said, he's always outnumbered on this side. But in every case, in every battle so far, Parmenian has never lost. And it doesn't look like, you know, normally when a, a unit is lost, it cracks like glass and it shatters and vanishes off the playing field. I've never seen any of Parmenian. What an amazing commander he must have been. Exercising the lockstep discipline for which they were known, Alexander's phalanx battalions refused to be intimidated by these contraptions. Instead, they simply opened lanes within their ranks, into which these horse-drawn chariots sped impotently. A few casualties were inflicted by the chariots here and there, but an effective combination of Agriani Javaneering, Royal Guard, and Army Grooms put an end to Darius's wild card, ripping the drivers from their vehicles and killing them. On Alexander's right, the clash between the companion cavalry and Bessus's horse intensified still further. For the Macedonians, it was a ferocious battle against the odds, with Peter Green stating that Alexander's 1,100 strong spearmen were fighting a force ten times its own size. Still more Persian cavalry units from the center entered the fray, attempting to dislodge these brilliant Macedonian warriors. It was then that Alexander saw his great opportunity. The singular focus on Bessus's engagement with Alexander had revealed a dangerous weakness in the Persian left center. Yeah, I just opened it all up. Darius himself was positioned. The line had been frayed, and many units that would otherwise have been protecting the great king were now absent, committed to fighting against the companions. Now, leading a spearhead of his companions, hypaspists, and several unengaged phalanx units, Alexander charged Darius directly. With the raising of a great battle cry, the Macedonian king's wedge mercilessly cut into the formations surrounding his Persian counterpart. Fighting was brutal and hand-to-hand. -hand. Macedonian cavalry spears thrust forward into the faces of the Persians, and Alexander even had more than one horse killed under him. With the help of the Phalangites, Alexander scythed his way closer and closer to Darius. The Persian king, who had grown increasingly uneasy ever since the battle began, is said by Curtius to have drawn his sword and prepared to defend himself. However, even with the fate of his centuries-old empire on the line, Darius's skittish nature once more got the best of him. Faced by the rampaging elites of the Macedonian army, the King of Kings turned tail and ran for his life. Witnessing the royal flight... It says here over the sidebar, the Indian cavalry in the center cut through the Macedonian gap and went straight to the Macedonian camp. So some units he's talking about, I guess, here got through. And they were kind of thinking the same thing, that maybe if their king was back at the camp, uh, who knows if they knew that Alexander would be over here and leading, you know, because their king sat back in the back, as they do. The majority of the Persian center collapsed. 
This yeah, these horsemen down here. Left, ...which gradually began disengaging in good order. The time was now for Alexander to seize Darius, and with him, the crown of the Achaemenid Empire. And so the chase began. However, before the bold and triumphant king of Macedonia could ride to claim his imperial prize, an urgent message arrived from Parmenia. The situation in the rear was critical. Unaware that their monarch had been driven off the field, Mazaeus and his overwhelming cavalry wing was on the verge of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Moreover, a stray band of Persian and Indian cavalry had drifted through a gap in the Macedonian phalanx and were ransacking the camp. Almost certainly gritting his teeth in frustration, Alexander looked back to where his loyal general required his urgent assistance, <laughs> forth where Darius was distancing himself with every passing second. After that second of hesitation, Alexander turned his troops around and charged the inner rear of the cavalry bearing down on Parmenian. Although victorious in this action also, against some of the best Parthian and Indian horsemen, over 60 of the companions were killed in the battle's hardest fighting. With the vast majority of Darius's army scattered to the four winds, and the Macedonians fully in control of the field, Parmenian rode to secure the Persian camp. The troops, meanwhile... Pause there. 60 companions died. Now the companions are basically his circle of best friends they're his top horsemen so when you hear about xerxes or any of the other or darius or any of the others losing their immortals that's kind of the same thing the mortals are like they're you know the elites they're the best friends all the guys that are in the best you know they're the best guards anyways i understand for alexander yeah when they refer to the companions they're referring to Pretty much his immediate circle, the top 60, and or you know, more. He said they're saying 60 of them got wiped out in this battle. So imagine losing 60 of your best friends in an hour. You know, plus everybody else, just being responsible in general, general, for 100,000 or more people. Crazy. But wow, what a battle, right? I mean, he everything just played out perfect. Everybody went where he wanted them to go. Opening up a huge, huge, huge hole. Allowing him to just divert away. The risk is having enough troops when he went to the to the right side over here. You know, being confident enough to take just enough horsemen to lure that group of horsemen. To be confident enough to leave units behind and take, well, they show two right off the way, two right off the bat, Alexander and another group, and possibly one other, then now split. And rush in and hit Darius here. So now Darius is re retreating and headed that way. Alexander says, Crap, I want to get him, get him, get him. And then he looks over in Parmenia. Oh, sh darn it, forgot about Parmenia over there. And he's got to run back over here to do the old hammer anvil. Smack, smack. But, yeah. So now it's like, oh my gosh. So close to just taking them out, and it's it's over. And it's not over. <clears throat> not by a long shot yet. Which sucks. We're allowed a well-deserved rest. Alexander could hardly be too irritated that his enemy had escaped. I would be a great army almost totally destroyed, his authority undermined, and the great king himself shown to be a coward unable to defend his empire. That being said, Darius had slipped the net, first to Arbella, where he regrouped with Bessus, and then further east.
with the defeat of the last of the great king's organized forces, it was now time to move east into the great expanse of the Persian Empire, where Darius was to be captured and Alexander could move on to the edge of the world. It's really to the south. Wars of Alexander will continue soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps. Absolutely, folks. If you're into stuff like this, it, uh, there's so many battles. They're not just doing Alexander over there. What an amazing channel, and I'm so happy that I found them and that I can, so far without any problems, uh, they have allowed me to use these clips without getting mad to illustrate the places that we're, we're flying around to in Microsoft Flight Simulator, just m making it all come to life. And I, I love it. I mean, this is the whole reason. I mean, why fly? Well, to get someplace. And uh, this is the first time I've ever flown uh, around the world. I spent, I was very, I'm very practical where this has been concerned. I don't just fly around to go see things. I spent the first two years in the first year in Alpha and then the first three years, so four years now, pretty much just keeping myself to Colorado and learning how to fly around the United States. And in that part of your training, you start doing more and more and more cross countries. And then we did a full, all the way from Colorado to the tip of Argentina down near the Antarctic over a two week period. And then it was time to come to Europe. We started out in Germany and we made our all the way down here. And I, what this wasn't planned. It's just that once we had traveled randomly through Neofly doing jobs and ended up down in Macedonia, I'm like, wow, this is Alexander the Great's home. Oh, wow, this is not too far from where he crossed. Oh, wow. These people have got the whole route laid out. Let's fly the route. I'm, I'm happy. I love it. I love it. I love doing this. This is awesome. Because when you fly around, you you know, it's, some of this stuff can be really boring. It doesn't change. It's, you, get hypno you get hypnotized by the land, and you're not really surveying it with a sense of history in mind. But pretty much every square inch of the earth, I'm finding out something something has gone down for the most part. Something went down no matter where you're at in the world. How pretty is this? Imagine getting your troops to enjoy, like, wow. Look at how awesome this is before going into a battle. Like hot springs and baths and look at that. Alexander's people are all out in the dirt, and his guys are out here taking baths, hanging out with the gals. No wonder. No wonder he wanted to stage over here. Um, so he lost his wife and children. It was customary when the king went to battle that his entire family went with. And even though he didn't go out to battle first and he stays back in the camp, because of that, you pretty much, if you lose, yeah, you do lose it all. If you die, there's no point in having all your the people that are going to get taken out eventually have to sit at home and try to run or flee or just whatever, just end it. You know, here, they're your, they're, they're your captives. It's over. And here's all the money. So he brought his family with him, and he brought all of his friends with him, and they brought all the money with them that they needed to do a large campaign like this. And Alexander's now captured every bit of it. So know what we know now earlier about his mindset after le leaving Egypt, and not just Yes, you're a deity. But really getting red pilled with potentially all that Anunnaki, ancient aliens information that's never really been attached to the Alexander story. You know, what he's thinking right about now. I mean, it's one, th one thing for somebody to tell you and then to face an army like this and everything just goes your way. It's like, wow, this really must be destiny, you know. Okay, so where does he go to next? We had mentioned it earlier. He's going to go to an area in 
what's now known as modern day Mosul. Other leaders from history have lost their people there, like Saddam Hussein. He lost his sons there. I have a really interesting story about that. I was reading up a lot about um, the history of the region during the Iraqi war. And in the past, I learned that uh, prior to that, that that they built because of the heat. They they instead of like in the Western world, we build up. All right, at that period of time, they always built down first. So in the world of Mesopotamia and this area in the Near East and other places, you always got to remember that they built down first. And there's always a city under a city, under a city, potentially. So this particular place throughout history has been known as one of the most evil places in the world, on the planet. It has the designation, what, if you have any children around, you might want to have them plug their ears for a moment. Shuffle them away. This place is so evil, it is called the Devil's Asshole. Satan's Asshole. Right? It's always been, you know, uh, most Eisley. The worst of the worst, screams, murders, just uh, the worst. How somebody like Jonah, in the story of Jonah being swallowed by the whale, I don't know where that took place, but this was Jonah's home, and he ended up coming back here. And I don't know if it's destroyed now because of the wars, but out along here somewhere is the, the mausoleum of Jonah. This is the burial place of Jonah. But man, what a, what a town he came from. Right? So Saddam Hussein's kids were on the run and nobody knew where they were. And I knew prior to that question that, you know, Mosul was going to be a big, big place to go because it's got an undercity. That's a great place to hide. So one day on Fox news they had some generals on there and they're like where do you think saddam's sons are at based on their last known location and da 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 da, da. and i they're like if you have something to say about this news topic go ahead and mail us at fox news and give us your opinions i'm like okay i'm like i think they're in mosul so maybe you should go there and get them first and they're like ah this email in from uh, from Kinius, and uh, he thinks they're in Mosul, and why don't we go there first? And they're like, well, we could do that, but we really want to go capture their capitals first. Anyway, it ended up being true. His, his kids were holed up in Mosul, and that's where they got him. All right. The point of all that is this is where Darius ran to. So we go back up north. Do, 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 do. That always cracks me up. Batman. Let's try to find it again. I'm trying to get both things on the screen. Oh, come on, you. Now the map's not giving up the names. I'm trying to keep my mouse over the area where... where we were. Come on, man. Okay. All right, either way, we're up here. And he's fleeing south. And the narrator said, now Alexander's going to go east into Mesopotamia. No, actually not. He's, he's, he's wrong. 
Alexander's going to go south. We're going to go south for a long way. He doesn't do any east at this point. He's just going south. And he's going to come down here to Baghdad. Then he's going to come down here near Susa, which is close to today's Basra. And they had a great capital city. This may be the corner edges of great capital city. I mean, look at how square that is. All right. So came down here, and then, then he's got to go north. Now he can go. He is going northeast, and he's going to be coming up in here, and then down and through here into India a little bit. All right, but let's see what Kings and Generals has next. Oh, you're kidding me. I was on the wrong screen. <laughs> sorry, folks. I'm so sorry. Here's Mosul. And directly north of here. is where we were just at, at the battle. So let me zoom out. Put my mouse over this. So right there. And now, okay, so it's not totally south. But back around these mountains, and then he's going to flee to Arbella, and then, which I believe is Mosul. All right. Helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links. And over the whole world goes a clamor of hysterical joy. So the next thing in the uh, Kings and Generals channel says the Battle of the Persian Gate, 333 BC. So we'll um. Get into that here in just a moment while this loads in. After this loads in. Okay. This is Mosul. And again, there's a city under a city under a city. Going back to ancient times, they built down before they built up. And so Darius is coming in. We turn in the direction that he's going to be coming. And if we look off into the distance, he's probably going to be coming in from that direction. And I wonder if that's what he was thinking too, is let's, you know, let's get to a place where we control and that has got crazy defenses. Who knows what he was thinking? But if he's thinking he's going to try to mount another battle, it, uh, it made sense to me that he ended up here on the retreat. Oh, you know what we forgot to do is go to Baalbek.
I need a break and I need to get some more tea. I am like so dry in my throat. Like that one of those like phlegmy swallows. Ugh. All right. I am going to um Put us into a break screen for just a moment so I can run off and grab some tea. Do. I don't know if she'll crash or not if I turn her, if I just let it go and walk away for a minute. I don't know if she'll hold altitude or not. Uh, we'll find out, I suppose. Let me get it facing south. I'm off to get some coffee. Be right back. Or the tea or whatever I can scramble up. Russell up. Well, good, she hasn't crashed, but she's going to. Had I been any longer. Okay. Alright, so let's pause it. Let's pick it up at the Kings and Generals channel and find out what where they're gonna pick up. Do 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 if I had some sound. In the defeat of Darius's second great army, but Alexander's failure to capture or kill Darius meant that the war was not over. The entirety of Persia's eastern provinces had been left relatively untouched by the war, and Darius would be able to gather enough money and manpower to raise a third army and challenge Alexander again. In order to complete his conquest, Alexander would need to push into the Persian heartland and remove Darius once and for all. You might know Alexander cared a lot about his image and would have wished things could be as easy as they are today with our sponsor, Manscaped. They're the world leader in men's grooming and hygiene, and thanks to them, you can get everything you need for head to toe grooming in the Performance Package Bundle, which includes the star of the show, the Lawnmower 4.0. That's a waterproof, cordless beard and ball. Manscaped.com slash kings, and you get 20% off, plus free international shipping. Following his defeat at Gorgamela, Darius withdrew to Media, effectively abandoning two of Persia's greatest cities, Babylon and Susa, as he knew that the eastern provinces could sustain the war effort. No, 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 no. The main thing Darius needed was time, and he hoped that Alexander that doesn't work with what we've just done. The wealthiest cities of the empire long enough for Darius to rebuild his forces. 
Alexander arrived at Babylon around October Okay, that does work. 3rd, 3 because Babylon is still a long ways from here. So the way that their map is, is not exactly, but as he came south, Mosul would have been way up north still. But they show that he's still on the run, and then he, that Darius cuts east. Not Alexander. Alexander's still going south. So... Dun, dun, dun. So we need to go to Babylon. And that is north west of Baghdad. So you'll see what I mean by the distance here in just a moment. Okay, that's Mosul. The staging point was way up here. It seems Darius is now going this way or he's going down this way. Not really sure, but now to get to Baghdad, Way down here. There's Tikrit. Crete. That means Baghdad is south of that. Here's Baghdad. There's Fallujah. So this is everything in here. Down in here. This is all ancient Babylon. Alright, let's zoom out again. To get a Big look at things. So here it is down here. There's Tikrit up here. And there's Mosul up here. So Alexander's coming this way. And there's this mountain range here. And Darius is making a break through some pass in here. Possibly through there, maybe. Trying to see, you know, what's the easiest way to get to the east through here. This seemed like it would be very difficult. So, best guess is that he's cutting through here. Or he goes through here, but according to this thing... It looks like he cut north through here. All right, so we back it up a tiny bit. See the mountain ranges along here, and then these valleys, and he's coming through here. And there's Mosul. We've got to be in here somewhere. Oh, there's a triangle, triangular body of water. No, but that's so, so far south. That's down here. This body of water, so let's shoot north. And look for a pass. Maybe through here. But then he comes into it. By the way, maybe through here? Well, we're in the right, roughly the right area. He's going this way, and Alexander's going down here now. Did it again. ...that Alexander would be distracted by two... I was on the wrong screen. Sorry, folks. Sorry. It's getting late. Sorry. Mosul's up here. Baghdad's here. Brit is here. And Darius from Mosul has gone east and is finding a route through here. And I'm imagining it's here. Yet going this way. He's fleeing into the mountains like. Whatever that other guy's name was. Bin Laden.
two of the wealthiest cities of the empire long enough for Darius to rebuild his forces. Alexander arrived at Babylon around October 23, 331 BC. The city, which had rebelled against Persian rule numerous times in its history, welcomed him with gifts. Babylon was one of the most impressive cities in the world, and Alexander treated his men to a well-deserved month-long rest, during which they were reinforced by men from Greece, Macedonia and Thrace, including approximately 15,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry. While his men enjoyed the luxuries, wine and women, Alexander occupied himself with administration. Satraps were appointed, mainly Greeks and Macedonians, but with one notable exception, the Persian satrap of Babylon, Mazaeus. Mazaeus had commanded the Persian right at Gorgamela, and was allowed to retain his position as satrap, having surrendered Babylon without a fight. This, combined with Alexander's partaking in Babylonian religious ceremonies, made some of Alexander's companions uneasy. Alexander had professed to be invading Persia as revenge for the Persian attacks on the Greeks. Appointing Persians and taking part in Eastern rites seemed to fly in the face of that agenda. This attempt to blend Eastern and Hellenic cultures would prove to be a consistent theme in Alexander's life from this point onwards. From Babylon, Alexander marched the 200 miles to Susa. Okay. I'll stop right there. Get back over here. Okay. So they're saying we're what they're calling on this map, ancient Babylon, is this region south of Baghdad. Well, basically the same area in here. They're staging between the two rivers. And all of this area was known as ancient Babylon. Again, one of the greatest cities in antiquity. So... You know, coming from Egypt, at one point, we're talking about an area that was greater than Egypt. So it should, it, you know, how, how big it is, we don't know, but it, it's probably extended all out way beyond what we're seeing at one point. But either way, he's down in here. So let's start our departure here. Uh, let me get rid of that screen. Found some orange juice. It's nice. Clear up the throat a little bit, I hope. Ooh. A bit of bite to it. You know, I'm so sorry. I've been at it so much. I haven't once checked the chat room. Normally in the evening, nobody chats. So, you know, so Benja YT was in the chat room and he laughed at me and said, ha 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 ha. <laughs> okay. I don't know at what point you found funny, but that's cool. So, hello, Benja. Sorry I missed you. All right, I need to make sure that we have the right controls for this. I hope this is right. Crush fingers. Or we're gonna go for a heck of a ride. Uh, that's not working. Well, that's working, but our yaw isn't working. Must have messed up one of my control profiles. Let's see what this one does.
That's good. That feels right. That's working. south all right so that's Baghdad proper over that way drop the nose down a little bit maybe I remember how to do this and operate this thing properly it may not have the trim controls set right. Okay, well, doesn't seem to. Just... Come on. Doesn't want to hold down. That's a horrible shadow on the windscreen that we've got going on. I don't like it. So I'm surprised that even through up to Saddam's time, this has all been heavily occupied. This must have been a place of importance. The mount, mounds. I talked about mounds a lot earlier. This is absolutely a place of importance.
Uh oh. Not too good with these things. Oh no. We're good. It didn't kill us. All right, we're in Baghdad. What I was going to say is I'm surprised at how, you know, like with Egypt, there's still skyscrapers everywhere. But here we are dealing with Baghdad and ancient Babylon. And the destruction is pretty much so complete that we can't, as with other places, at least at the moment, it's not just jumping out of the terrain. Um, that this was the site of a super city. You know, there aren't, I'm not right off the bat, not seeing any super large structures indicating palaces or royal complexes. I mean, those to seem to be some pretty big ones over there. That's more in the direction of the old, where the old city was supposed to be. You do have these waterways that are super straight. There are no meandering going on there. You can tell that they were they were definitely masters of that. All right, and then it's going to get more modern. It looks like way over there in Baghdad today proper. Yeah, that's huge going that way. That's Super City. Let me try another different control. See if I can get the, uh, the trim right on this thing. I know one set of controls was set right for it, but it was still wrong, but I know that one of these was working. Let's try that one again. Come on, nose down. With the doctor. Okay, let's try that one. No. Well, at least got it's got that part right on the down. Let me see. Nose down. No, maybe not. No. That seems to be right, but no, yeah. The trim is right. I'm getting nose trim. No, y'all. Wow. Wow. this one.
Nope. Oh yeah. Oh well. in 20 days. Following Gorgamela, he had already sent men ahead to secure the city's surrender, and once again the city was taken without a fight, Alexander also finding almost 50,000 talents worth of gold and silver. Back in Greece, a Spartan-led revolt had arisen, and Alexander was now able to send a large amount of money back to Macedonia to help Antipater stay on top of the situation, as well as making sure to pay his own troops a generous bonus for their service so far. Alexander did not spend long in Susa, though. Darius was still his priority, and so, rather than wait out the winter in the city, Alexander headed to the Zagros Mountains. The Zagros Mountains were in the territory of the warlike Uxian tribe. The Persians had never been able to completely subdue the tribe, settling for an agreement where the Persians paid a fee to the Uxians if they needed to pass through their lands, in return for which the Uxians would not bother the Persians. When Alexander approached, the Uxians similarly demanded that he also pay the fee. Alexander seemed to agree to this sending messengers requesting a meeting in the defiles to pay the tax. Precisely what happened next is not clear, and our sources differ drastically. According to Arian, after sending the messengers to the Uxians, Alexander was informed by men from Susa about a pass around the defile and took a force of 1,000 hypaspists and another 8,000 infantry along this path. He fell upon some Uxian villages in the night, killing many and forcing the remainders to flee into the mountains. Alexander then split his force, sending some under Craterus to wait in ambush on high ground, while Alexander took his portion of the army on a forced march to the defile, reaching it before the Uxians. From this commanding position, Alexander was easily able to rout the Uxians, who tried to flee to the high ground, but were ambushed there by Craterus's force and cut down. Quintus Curtius Rufus, however, gives a very different account. He claims that Alexander sent a force of 2,500 light infantry under Toron, one of his lieutenants, to take the path around the Uxian's position. Alexander, meanwhile, led the main force in a difficult siege of an Uxian city. Siege towers were built, and the Uxians inflicted many casualties from their strong defensive position. Alexander kept up the attacks, however, until Toron finally emerged behind the Uxian's position, at which point they surrendered. The two accounts have enough similarities that they are surely discussing the same battle, but they seem almost impossible to reconcile. In general, Arian's history was better researched, and primarily used two eyewitness accounts. His work undoubtedly has flaws, often overlooking some of the more negative actions of Alexander, and assuming some of the biases of the eyewitness sources. But he is generally the most reliable when it comes to military affairs. In comparison, Rufus's main source was Cleitarchus, who was not an eyewitness, and was generally considered by the ancients to be an excellent writer, but an inaccurate historian. Rufus did use other sources as well, but his work was often more interested in the psychology of Alexander than the military details. As such, Arian's version is generally the one that is preferred. Okay. I saw war. I saw... Oh. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of booming over there. Um... Okay, uh, here's the way I see it. You've been told that you're a deity, you're of the Anunnaki bloodline, you've been red-pilled hard in Egypt, you've just, in a matter of moments in time, wiped out Darius with no problem, just reconfirming everything that you're, you are believing now. And you've been to Babylon now. Now, you still haven't made your heart way into the heart of Anunnaki territory, although Babylon was later in time 
a big center hub. But that's not where operations began, and that's not still the heart of the situation. That's still more to the south and and uh, where he's headed uh, later. But he's still so red-pilled enough that when you run into people like this as you're traveling through the mountains who really may or may not have got the memo that I am now the king, this is all mine. Everything. There is no more Darius. There is no... Uh, there's no uh, succession to these lines. I am the new king. I control all of Macedon. I am uh, the new Anunnaki in charge. I'm the one that's supposed to be in charge. Nobody's going to try to get me to pay a, 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 a toll fee in my territory. Bull. So the first story where they're hitting them up for for some money. I can see if they're like, hey, hey, cool. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Can we have some money? And he'd be in like, well, okay, my good man. But that's not the way it's going down. He had to actually siege these people. And so that's the way I see it, that he's like, hey, no. Bow down. I'm, you know, I'm it now. Okay, so where that took place, I'm not, I wasn't paying that much attention, so I don't know where to teleport us directly to at the moment. I saw... Boomy. Lots of Boomy. We discussed that earlier, and I don't really want to get into it, but those people in that area when Alexander went through were already making everybody mad. Nobody liked them. And they managed to piss off Alexander so far, it seems, worse than anybody. Uh, one moment, please. I have a call coming in. Uh, I'll be back with you in just a moment. It was my mother. My mother. What can you do? Right? Love your mothers while you got them. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the bombing. Uh, those people have been making people mad. Whichever version is favored, though, the outcome was the same. All the way back the to the beginning of time. For peace. What, what did they want? Messages to Darius's mother to Look in the mirror. Behalf. Alexander agreed, enforcing a yearly tribute of horses and livestock from the Uxians, and then pressing on into Persis, the heart of the Persian Empire. Okay, I know where he's at. The mountains into okay. Persis, Alexander split his army in two. Parmenion would take the less direct but easier route, leading the Thessalian cavalry, Greek allies and other mercenaries, along with the baggage train. Alexander, meanwhile, would lead the main phalanx, companions, light cavalry, agrarians and archers. Approximately 14,000 to 20,000 men on a... Okay, so he went where he was at is Susa was a huge, huge, huge capital. Okay, so let me go to Google and type in Susa. Because he went to Susa before he went to Persepolis. And Persepolis was Darius' capital, basically. And it was a capital back to ancient times as well. <clears throat> and he's partying there, and they get so hammered, they decide, well, they said it, they'll tell you. He says it was a matter of, you know, do we keep it or do we burn it down? Do we want this to still be a capital, or or what are we going to do with this place? And it seems, in some accounts, they're like, he wrecked it, and he wrecked it so good, he didn't want any bit of it left. He wanted the, he wanted the defeat to be absolutely complete. Okay, so, and we got to get rid of this helicopter. It's not doing us any darn good. Better to use the ornithopter, even.
So I think that is modern day Basra, but we're going to find out here. Just a moment. Okay, close. Let's see, where's Basra? Okay, Basra's right here. Okay, so it's north of Basra, and it, it look at this valley that it's in. It's so lush and so green. You know, kind of like your hoity-toity areas like Aspen and Vale, and you can see why a place that's kind of like an oasis out in the nothingness. How this was a, a capital area. Okay, so he made his way here. And this looks like, I want to say this looks like more an ancient city in here. But can't be certain. Let's try this again here. See if we get uh, closer. Yeah, it was on the spot. All right, so that's Bosra. Now Persepolis, I was going to head south. This, I, I wish he wouldn't have destroyed it. That's it's such a dang shame because some of the the stuff you see there sticking out of the ground is so mind blowing. If you don't believe me, just type in Persepolis and just look at some of the <clears throat> just look at some of the stuff that remains. It is such a tragedy that they really decided to just go and just destroy everything. Okay. Oh no, was I not showing you? I was on the wrong I was on the wrong map again. Ah Zooming you down in, here's Basra down here. And then north of Basra into this fan shaped valley. This is it. This is where he was. This is this was Susa. Okay, and Persepolis is over here somewhere. Is. Yeah. In another green belted area against this mountain. And as soon as we zoom in, let I me mean, look at this, just this plaza right here, even today. All right, so all of this, the ancient site of Persepolis. What do they got going on over here? with this something look at this it's all overgrown now but look at the circles in the ground this must have been uh a, again a building of importance possibly it i want to say a temple but you know i don't know but obviously there was a giant circular structure here same with here and then a, a comp a giant complex here and if we keep following this road where it splits after that roundabout, yeah, again, it takes us up to these, which have been giant courtyards, into this large structure, and then in through the giant gates, 
I wonder if these were walls at one point or are still. Some way walls. These look like giant pillars for walls and buildings. Again, they got a huge, huge complex. All right, and that's where our story is going to pick back up. A forced march through the mountains, aiming for the Persian ceremonial capital of Persepolis. Unbeknownst to Alexander, a Persian force under the command of Ariobazanes, a veteran of Gorgomela, had built a makeshift wall across the narrow pass through the mountains, known as the Persian Gate, and was waiting for him. The exact size of Ariobazanes' army is of some debate. Ancient sources give Ariobazanes' numbers as being between 25 and 40,000 infantry with a few hundred cavalry, while some modern writers give a number as low as 700 total. The number of 40,000 is likely exaggerated, as was often the case with Greek sources giving Persian numbers, but the number of 700 is almost certainly too low. In order to arrive at such a low number, one would have to almost completely disregard the ancient sources entirely and assume that the Persians only fielded a fraction of their total military power to defend the capital. Leading experts on Alexander, such as Heckel, Worthington, Borser, and Lane Fox, tend to agree that the ancient sources which claim 40,000 are too large, usually preferring the sources that give their number as at maximum 25,000. Alexander's force passed through the narrow gorge until they found their way blocked by the wall. Suddenly, Ariobazanes' men attacked the Macedonian column from both sides, showering Alexander's ranks with a mix of missile fire and rocks. The Macedonians took severe casualties in this initial ambush, with the terrain making it almost impossible for Alexander's men to fight effectively. As more of his men were killed or wounded, Alexander signaled a retreat. The narrow pass made such a withdrawal difficult, however, and his men were continuously harassed by arrows and javelins from the Persians. Finally, though, Alexander's force managed to extract itself from the gorge and establish a camp. While encamped, Alexander had any Persian prisoners that had recently been taken brought to him and questioned about any other routes around the Persian position. One of these prisoners had been a shepherd in the area, and in return for a hefty reward, agreed to show Alexander a path around Ariobazanes' defences. Taking the majority of the army with him, Alexander made for this path, leaving Craterus with approximately 3,000 infantry and 500 cavalry and archers in the camp, and with orders to light extra fires at night to make it appear as if the entire army was still there. Alexander's force departed in the night. It was still midwinter, and the mountain cold and rough terrain made it a particularly difficult journey. Partway through, Alexander came to a split in the mountain path. One of these led more directly to Ariobazanes' position. The other circled even further behind, leading to the Persian camp. Alexander ordered Philotas and 3,000 men to take the first, while he led the remaining force along the second path around the Persian camp. After a day and two nights of grueling marching, Alexander's men were finally in position. After resting his men, Alexander began the attack, falling upon the Persian camp and blasting trumpets as he did so. At this signal, the forces of Craterus and Philotas also attacked the Persians, who now found themselves attacked on three sides. Ariobazanes' men fought back bravely and desperately, despite being almost completely surrounded. It soon became clear, however, that the battle was lost, and Ariobazanes, along with 40 cavalry, were able to cut their way out of the encirclement and escape. The rest of the Persian force was cut down to a man. It is not exactly clear how long Ariobazanes and his men had been able to delay Alexander, but some modern sources suggest it had been almost a month. The amount of casualties the Macedonians took is also not given in the sources, though it seems clear that they were significant. 
Though Ariobazanes had fought bravely, his fate is not clear. Arian says he simply escaped into the hills, while Rufus says he fled to Persepolis but found the gates barred to him and was eventually killed by Alexander's men. Despite the losses and delay, however, Alexander had once again managed to salvage victory, and the route to Persepolis now lay open to him. The governor of Persepolis sent messages to Alexander, and with Ariobazanes' force having been destroyed, offered to turn the city over to Alexander, an offer he gladly accepted. En route to the city, a number of sources mention that Alexander's army came across a group of Greeks on the road, usually given as numbering 800, all of whom were old and mutilated. They had all apparently been skilled craftsmen, captured by the Persians and mutilated in order to prevent them from escaping. Moved to pity at the sight of them, Alexander made sure to award land, riches and grain to all of them, ensuring that they would live out their remaining days in luxury. How true or not this story is, is hard to say. Alexander certainly was known as a generous man, who often gave lavish gifts. However, given the later actions of Alexander and his army in Persepolis, it may be that these mutilated Greeks were an invention of pro-Alexander sources to justify the subsequent events. I don't know. Oh, can't play this. Hello. I'll get in trouble. <clears throat> okay, looking down on the map. Turn the sound off on this and have this play in the background. Okay, so looking down on the map. This is Persepolis. Okay, this complex we're looking at um, against the mountain. All of this, okay. It is really difficult to see what passes they were talking about. But we seem to be in the earlier picture. Again, we're coming from uh, coming from over here. So somewhere that all took place somewhere in here, and it's so confusing. I mean, there's so many mountains. I couldn't tell you which pass. I mean, if we kept really putzing around, I could probably find out exactly. Excuse me, where? But either way, he has now managed to do all of that in here. And then make his way, it seems, down through here. Into Persepolis. What a neat formation that is. And that. And everything behind the hill. Everything in this area is really neat. All of this. And again, it's also, again, neat to remember, again, what I said earlier, that they build down before they build up. So everything on the surface is newer. Okay, is this commercial over yet? Oh. January of 330 BC, Alexander claimed the massive Persian treasury of 120,000 talents, sending the majority back to Susa. Persepolis was one of the richest and most brilliant cities in the world at the time, and many of Alexander's men took to looting the city. Whether this was on Alexander's orders and the extent of the looting is debated. Arian is silent on the issue, but Diodorus and Rufus paint a grim picture. According to them, looting was ordered by Alexander specifically, and the Macedonians proceeded to kill many civilians, with some Persians preferring to kill themselves instead. The Macedonians spent an entire day looting houses and palaces, and even fought and killed one another in order to get the most and best riches. Alexander himself celebrated his winning of the city by banqueting and drinking in the palaces of the Persian kings with his companions and courtesans. Diodorus, Plutarch and Rufus all claim that during this drinking session, an Athenian courtesan called Thais 
proposed that they should burn the Persian palaces down, pointing out how ironic it would be for an Athenian woman to be burning the Persian capital after they had burned Athens 150 years earlier. The drunk Macedonians welcomed the suggestion, and led by either Thais or inebriated Alexander himself, burned the renowned palaces of Persepolis. A slightly different account is given by Arian, who does not mention Thais or Alexander being drunk, instead saying that Alexander burnt the palaces as a calculated act of revenge for the burning of Athens. It is possible that Thais was simply being used as a scapegoat to try and exonerate Alexander, whose destruction of Thebes had already shown that he certainly had the capacity to destroy great cities to make a political statement. What is clear from all the sources, however, is that none of them approved of this decision. Arian says that it was, in essence, simply a foolish decision by Alexander, particularly because he was effectively burning what was now his own property. Plutarch includes a hasty apologia that Alexander regretted this decision and ordered the fires to be put out. Diodorus says that it was done by Alexander in a drunken madness. Rufus's account is perhaps the most poignant. Such was the end of the capital of the entire Orient, from which so many nations once sought jurisdiction, the birthplace of so many kings, once the special terror of Greece, and not even in the long age which followed its destruction did it rise again. Rufus was exaggerating somewhat, much of the city remained standing, the fire being concentrated on the palaces and surrounding buildings, but it nonetheless gives us an insight into how ancient authors viewed the episode. Alexander spent approximately four months in and around Persepolis, at some point during this time, making a 30-day excursion to Pasargadae, the old Persian capital. Sometime around May, the Macedonian king continued his pursuit of Darius, heading into Media. Darius, who had been in Ecbatana, heard of Alexander's movements. Though Darius had been planning to amass a third great army to fight Alexander, he had thus far been unsuccessful. And so, with a few thousand men, he fled Ecbatana, hoping to retreat further into the eastern provinces of the empire. Alexander, in turn, sent Parmenion and the slow-moving baggage train, loaded with money, to seize the now-abandoned Ecbatana, while he led approximately 20,000 men in pursuit of Darius. His plan initially was to catch Darius before he could pass through the Caspian Gates, the passes in the Albors Mountains that led from Media to Parthia and Hyrcania. Alexander led his men on a grueling 10-day force march through the difficult terrain, enduring their dehydration and suffering alongside them. Despite their efforts though, upon reaching the gates, they discovered that Darius- I'm so sorry. While he was talking there, I was zooming around looking at all the places. Now, If you were up on current, current conspiracy theory, like within the last year, okay, then you know what I'm looking at. And right? I can't zoom in any more than that. Do you do you know what I'm saying? That's interesting to me. Very interesting. Okay. So, because I was zooming around and getting caught up in that, uh, I wasn't paying enough attention to this, where he's going to leave now. Edia. Darius, who had been in Ecbatana, heard of Alexander's movements. Though Darius had been planning to amass a third great army to fight Alexander, 
he had thus far been unsuccessful, and so with a few thousand men he fled Ecbatana, hoping to retreat further into the eastern provinces of the empire. Alexander in turn sent Parmenion and the slow-moving baggage train, loaded with money, to seize the now abandoned Ecbatana, while he led approximately 20,000 men in pursuit of Darius. His plan initially was to catch Darius before he could pass through the Caspian Gates, the passes in the Albors Mountains that led from Media to Parthia and Hyrcania. Alexander led his men on a grueling 10-day force march through the difficult terrain, enduring their dehydration and suffering alongside them. Despite their efforts though, upon reaching the gates, they discovered that Darius had already passed through them. Alexander allowed his men a few days of rest, before pushing on again through the gates towards Parthia. The speed of Alexander's march was having an effect though. In Darius's camp, more and more of his remaining generals and advisors were losing faith in him. Led primarily by Bessus, the satrap of Bactria, a conspiracy formed against the great king. Some in the army remained loyal, notably the remaining Greek mercenaries, commanded by a man named Patron and Artabasos. Nevertheless, the cracks were clear. Bessus's faction even suggested to Darius that he make Bessus king instead, on the understanding that Bessus would return the kingship after defeating Alexander, an offer Darius understandably refused. Patron tried to convince right? Darius to accept his Greek mercenaries as his bodyguards, but Darius refused, not wanting to seem like he was favoring the Greeks. Eventually, Darius accepted his fate. He dismissed his servants and inner circle, assuring them that he would prefer to die by another's crime rather than my own. Then he waited in his tent and was promptly seized by Bessus and his allies and put in chains. Bessus, a part of the Achaemenid dynasty himself, proclaimed <coughs> himself king, taking the name Artaxerxes V. The Greek mercenaries and others who had been loyal to Darius dispersed, the remaining troops continuing under Bessus's command. Okay, it's a good place for us to... Oh, come on, Mouse, where are you? Okay. If I had the wrong screen up, and I'm like, wow, if you're in the conspiracy theories, look at this and look at that and look at this. Uh, and you couldn't see anything because I was on the wrong screen. Uh, I was highlighting blue rooftops. Okay. I was noticing that some of these, as we zoom in on, they've either, either the satellite imagery has marked them in blue, or they have blue rooftop, but I don't think that they are. Because there's a lot of things going on here. That's not just one solid sheet of metal or sheets of metal when you you know it's it's it looks like the computer, the satellite, AI, whatever that is doing this map has laid down grids either that we can't see, but either way it's marking with blue roof. All right, and I said, if you know about modern conspiracy theory, within the last year, the whole subject of Blue Roof has been coming up. And so I was highlighting Blue Roof structures. Okay, so he's going to leave here, and he's going to go up to Ecbatana. And now, uh, and we'll find out exactly... Because I the sto I've heard several different endings to this story. It's still not over over the journey and the route. But this would be like the middle climax the climax of the story. <coughs> but there's there's still you know the end. Um I need to get Ectopatana. Because the way I heard one story, by the time he got to Ecbatana, not beyond it, at it, is when this conspiracy against him took place. And I never heard, uh, I heard being put in chains, but they make it seem like it was more of a, um, a jail cell or whatever. And in the movies, 
they chain him to his carriage. You know, with their transporting him in. They just chain him to his throne seat. And and then killed him at Ekbatana. But this is this that story. Or I just again my memory's wrong and I'm just I have it all wrong. But let me get Ekbatana. Okay, copy. Paste the coordinates from Google into here, delete that. Punch it. Select what pops up. Okay, Ekbatana. Wow. Wow, look at how it's laid out. And I thought the circular cities, this is how stupid I am. That like the time Leonardo da Vinci, now we're already talking, you know, 13th century, right? That it was really cool that like da Vinci had done the architecture or somebody of renown had done the architecture on their cities and planned them circular like this to move, be able to quickly move forces in and out. And it was such a revolutionary thing, man. And then we look back on the ancient world to this period of time. And Ekbatana already has a circular layout. Now, whether this came later in time, I don't know. Neat. Okay. So in the stories that I've heard, they've already they've already taken Darius prisoner here. But they're saying no. They're saying he hooked up with this gentleman here that ran this place north of here. And so when we zoom out, some of these ancient places just let me cancel this. You have to zoom in so far to see if certain other little tiny places will pop up. And the names have changed so many times that when you go to search these ancient places or look for them here and you're like, I don't see that at all. Um, okay. We need to find out where they're... Let me rewind this. Uh, okay, the burning of Persepolis, Parthia, Darius. Okay. All right, so we need to, this text to move down. We need to find out the name of this city-state right here where they're at now. Try to go just a tiny bit back. Zadrakarta. So let me go back over to Google. Zadrakarta. Pull open the wiki, look for the coordinates. Coordinates, coordinates. Really? There's no coordinates on this page. Is a name recorded by Greek historians referring to the largest city of Hyrcania? Wasn't Conan's companion, the guy with the bow and arrow in the first movie, wasn't he a Harkanian? I'm Harkanian, an archer. Right? Okay, so let's let me click on Harkania and see if we can get coordinates. Middle Persian, Akkadian, Urquanu, 
bound in the south by the Alborz mountain range, east of the Caspian Sea. Old Persian, recorded by Darius the Great. The capital nearby is Gurgan. I can't believe it. I can't. This is the only one that is not giving me, uh, not giving us coordinates. Let's try. Looking up Gergen, see if we get coordinates. We have coordinates. Got it. All the way up here. I said while we're here, I wanted to go hit some of these places up. Now we're getting into the heart of Anunnaki territory because we're dealing with the ziggurat of, of, of Ur. So Ur and Eridu and Sumer are in this area. So now we're into the, yeah, we're, we're at the heart of the Anunnaki base operations. Okay, so back north. And we're here. Not the most interesting of layouts, but it was... Obviously, instead of staying in the other town that looked like it would have been in Abactra, which looked like it would have been way more fortified... Again, maybe he, if he's worried about this guy taking over, he didn't want to stay at his place. But there... <laughs> Gone bad. E... Cobus? I don't know. Okay, that looks like it was a, an important structure at one point. Maybe not. Could just be the local Walmart. Looking for things that look like stronghold. There's the stronghold. There's the airport. A lot of twists and turns. Man. So where would where would Darius have been? In all this in the city or look for outskirts and more amazing things outside. Don't know. All right, well, let's get back to this. Darn it, you're not seeing where I'm at again. I keep forgetting to turn back on the switcher. It's one of those, the automatic scene switcher. It either saves you or it kills you. Right? Because normally I have it on. So anytime I move away from uh, one screen, it automatically will get back to you. So let me go back over here. And anytime I click back to the simulator, it once it starts. Do do do, do yes, no, yes. Oh, now it's misbehaving. All right, whatever. Hunted by a man named Patron and Artabasos. Nevertheless, the cracks were clear. Bessus's faction even suggested to Darius that he make Bessus king instead, on the understanding that Bessus would return the kingship after defeating Alexander, an yeah. offer Darius understandably refused. In a circle, assuring them that he would prefer to die by another's crime rather than my own. 
Then he waited in his tent and was promptly seized by Vessus and his allies and put in chains. Vessus, a part of the Achaemenid dynasty himself, proclaimed himself king, taking the name Artaxerxes V. The Greek mercenaries and others who had been loyal to Darius dispersed, the remaining troops continuing under Bessus' command. Word of Darius's capture soon reached Alexander late one night through deserters. Alexander immediately picked 500 of his best cavalry and set off in pursuit. They rode at breakneck pace for a day and two nights, and by dawn of the second day, they had closed in on Bessus' party. Bessus's force, having been on a continuous march and depleted by numerous desertions, was in no position to fight, and many fled seeing Alexander closing in, Bessus and his Bactrians among them. Before he fled, however, Bessus made sure that Darius would not be able to concede the crown to Alexander, ordering him to be killed. A small skirmish was fought between Alexander and the few Persians that had not fled, and a search for Darius began. He was soon found by one of Alexander's companions, Polystratus. The great king had been stabbed by javelins and was on the brink of death. He asked for water and after drinking, thanked Polystratus and, according to some sources, asked that Alexander be thanked for treating his family with kindness. By the time that Alexander arrived on the scene, Darius had died. Alexander ordered that his body be transported back to Persepolis, where he received a magnificent funeral and was buried alongside the other Persian kings. Darius III is often seen by many as having been an incompetent coward. This is largely thanks to a passage of Arian, who calls him preeminently effeminate in military matters, a view that for a while was largely agreed upon even in academic scholarship. More recently, though, this idea has been challenged, notably by Badin and Marston. In terms of his personal bravery, Justin and Diodorus both agree that Darius was renowned for his courage, having in his youth killed a Caducian champion in single combat. Indeed, it was partly because of his bravery that he was chosen to be king. The fact that at both Issus and Gorgomela, Darius took to the field personally is a further testament to his courage. Though he retreated in each battle, the sources are clear that Darius only fled when things were looking disastrous. At Issus, for instance, the horses pulling his chariot had both been badly wounded, almost leaving him stranded, and at Gorgomela, his chariot driver was killed and himself possibly wounded. In terms of military matters, while there is no need to portray Darius as a military genius, he was not utterly incompetent. Darius was forced to take the field after the death of Memnon of Rhodes, and in just a few months had amassed a significant army to confront Alexander at Issus, no small feat of logistics. Issus was a poor choice of battlefield, not allowing the renowned Persian cavalry room to maneuver. But Darius learned from the mistake and picked an excellent location for his next battle at Gorgomela. Prior to the battle, he also made sure to drill his troops extensively to increase their discipline. On both occasions, he was outmatched by Alexander. However, being defeated by one of history's greatest tacticians is no source of shame. It is also worth pointing out that at Gorgomela in particular, the Persians were able to force a gap in the Macedonian line and almost crush the Macedonian left. The battle was only won because of Alexander's audacious generalship, and Darius may well have been victorious against a lesser opponent. Darius's fleeing from both battles is often held as evidence of his cowardice. However, it is worth pointing out that on both occasions, retreating was probably the best strategic decision. If Darius had died or been captured at Issus, for example, it is likely that Alexander would have been easily able to proclaim himself as the king of Persia there and then. Darius's survival from both battles was crucial for there to be any kind of organized Persian resistance to the invaders. As a result, it is perhaps better to treat Darius as Alexander did, with respect. Many in Alexander's army assumed that the campaign would soon be over. Years ago, Philip II had first pitched the invasion of Persia to the League of Corinth, largely as an act of revenge. 
Alexander had also espoused this same message. With the death of the Persian king and the sacking of Persepolis, it seemed that those goals had been achieved. However, Alexander was not ready to settle. Bessus's murder of Darius gave Alexander sufficient cause to continue the war, insisting that the pretender must be killed or else risk another Persian invasion of Greece. Right. Because this guy who has that really badass town believed himself strong enough to just kill Darius. And it also said that he was in the if I got it correctly, that he, Bessus, is in the bloodline. And he's the Akkadian ruler, the human ruler of the Akkadians. But again, what we're dealing with is prior and prehistory, the handing down of these territories into human rule from the Anunnaki. And them picking the, the bloodlines of who, what human families were those were to be and so they specifically made that said that Bessus was the ruler of the Akkadians by bloodline okay so Alexander's absolutely right you have to take over all these territories because you're not you now believe that you're the commander of this part of the world you're in the bloodline, and there's been these wars going on, and you have the uh, the right to go down there on behalf of the northern factions. This still extends all the way up into across the world. If you want to believe that connection, I have no way of reading Sumerian tablets. I mean, I can if I had the, 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 the means to, but just having them in front of me and the text in, the, in front of me, I couldn't translate. So I've had to rely on other historians, whether they've been discounted or not. I've had to just read whatever I can. So there are the common stories of the Zoroastrian religion, and then there is the what a lot of people are claiming is BS because they don't want it to be, I think, as crazy as it's going to get. But according to the, the Sumerian tablet translations from Zachariah Sitchin, the Anunnaki came to Earth from Nibiru, and not far from here, back down south, uh, and all throughout here, they uh, set up shop, and it was a huge landing party of heroes, and this is why I said we need to go back to some of these older towns. We need to go back to like the Ziggurat of Ur and uh, do, 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 do. And we need to find Eridu. So let me go back to. Okay, so we're, this is where we're at. We were up north way up here where they killed Darius you're dealing with uh, the ruler Bessus from an area down here which was an amazing Akkadian city Ekbactra in the past so the Anunnaki came in into this region and all throughout this region but they wanted specifically all the river outflows into the into this region for mining operations, for the gold mining operations. Okay. So, down here there was earlier, we saw it. Let me go back to Google. Era, do you? Let me get the location of that, the coordinates. So yeah, so he needs to take out Bessus. What happened there? Copied the wrong thing. Oh. 
Only a king can kill a king. And he, but he was a king. He actually had the right. The way I see it. He was right. But Alexander was still mad and he still had to take him out anyway. So, okay. This is the site where at least Google is telling us this is the site of ancient Eridu. All right, so one of the first settlements of the Anunnaki. And if you're looking at it and going, well, man, every other place that we've been to, you can clearly see outlines of city and things that were going on. How come, how come we don't really, really see that? I think you are, it's just that what happened is there was the Great Flood, right? So not only are the Anunnaki set up before the Great Flood happens, there were also later in time weapons of mass destruction, like nuclear scale or more, you, uh, detonated on the planet, and the wind shifted back into certain people's territories destroying them instead of the enemy or you know they still wiped out the large swaths of their what they considered you know another faction the enemy but that could also explain one the coverage and two just everything being had been nuked at one point but everything would have been flooded and as reported from the uh in histories the flood came from the south And came up here and flooded everything. So, uh, now let's go to Earth. Now, earlier when we were in Egypt, when he went into the temple to talk to the priests, only he went in, so nobody knows for certain what the discussion was about. But now we have all these tablet translations, and he's being, I believe that um, they knew the history, they knew all this stuff. And nobody but Alexander's closest, closest, closest people are going to understand the magnitude of the story at this point. Okay, I hope I set that up right. Uh, okay, so while that's loading in, let's get back over to the story. And why he has to take out, what's his name, Bessus. Such a situation was almost certainly unrealistic, but as we shall see in the coming episodes, oh. Alexander's ambition would soon stretch even beyond the borders of the Persian Empire. If you don't want to miss any of these episodes, make sure you are subscribed. Yes, and press yes. The bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one. You people are the greatest. The greatest, the greatest. Okay. Uh... So it looks like we're going to get the story in the next episode. And I have spawned us in over the ziggurat of Ur. Okay.
you can make out the markings of an ancient city under the ground. Again, flooded. Flooded, nuked. But you can still see it if you just really, really are looking down there. Look at the patterns. That's too bad. It's not it, it's not three-dimensional as I'm seeing. It's in the map and it looks like it's there when you uh when we come in, but I'm not seeing it. Could be I'm my elevation is too much. But we'll come down a little bit. So I want to say that Ur, now this is the the home of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh is the first human ruler after the Great Flood in the transition period where the Anunnaki are handing power over to humans. And out here in this now i can start seeing the square the layout okay so it would have been this square structure here i think would have been the ziggurat yeah. let's pause it and go out Oh, really? Is pause not set up on this? Uh-oh. They don't have pause set up on the ornithopter, or I don't have the key value. To... Right. Get our gear down. You come on. Really? I'm trying to get drone view, but that's not working. That's a, a drag because I really needed to get us into the air. Uh, So Gilgamesh, to me, he was. I was going back to Gilgamesh, the, the the first human king after the flood. This is his base of operation, and he's all tied into these bloodlines as well. So his quest, very similar to Alexander's. So he's king, and he's told he's descended, and he's he's all red pilled as to the histories. And so he leaves and he heads up 
to Lebanon, where Alexander was at Baalbek, which we still haven't gone to, which we need to get to. And he's looking to find out more about his deityhood as well. And he pretty much, I guess, gets everything he needs at Baalbek for the most part. And that's where they battle a creature called Humbubba. And that sounds hilarious, doesn't it? Humbubba. Or Humbubba. It's too bad that they don't have it. I want an Ancient Aliens pack with high, high, high definition maps of all these ancient sites. The ancient alien sites. You know the pass around the area? And again, it's so weird. This is literally the locations of the very... One of the very first places civilizations on earth and yeah it's, they don't look even to this day they don't look like new york city Double, let me double check here. Let me go out and do Sumer. I'm pretty sure that's, that's kind of where we were. Man, as far as the... Check this out. As far as the to navigate to it it's pretty much like right at the a nexus of two coordinate uh, two lines check this out normally coordinates are long a long string of numbers and when we get back into here this is the coordinates for sumer 3246 not this All right, so we need to go back to Old Spice Shampoo. Smells great and helps. Okay. All right, down below us is the site of the ancient city of Sumer. And there's an interesting story about Sumer that is very similar to today. And they talk about history repeating itself. After being flooded, uh, during the Great Flood, and then potentially killed from fallout from weapons of mass destruction being detonated on Earth. Um, there are stories about the city collapsing from liberalism. So, you know, the world was a rough place, and the people of Sumer had big walls and great defenses, and as you can see, how clean these highways are, and waterways are. And they used to, they talk about all the 
transportation and the barges and the the flow of goods and services along these waterways and highways they had the most advanced amazing highways and waterways and way out on the outskirts of the land you know lived a lot of shady people some of them you know they they meant well good people but the liberals in Sumer kept crying, saying, you need to let everybody in. Open the gates. There's enough for everybody. And the conservatives, who got called Nazis, and said, you're going to collapse us, you know. We can only do so much, and you're, you're really risking allowing bad people to come in and um collapsing us and they said nah brawl come on let everybody in look at the grid system of waterways so things like uh agriculture the wheel the calendar mathematics astrology Everything. Weaving. It all started in places like this. I was mentioning uh, earlier in the show, like, was it this show or the earlier show? I was talking about one of the guys in the landing party that came down from Nibiru. His name was Dan. I'm not kidding. Dan. Really? A guy from outer space? Part of the landing party? His name was Dan? Yeah. And there's some territory, there, if it's... If I can find it, type in Lake Dan here. See if I can find anything. Like Van. Did I have the name wrong? Dan? It's Van? Oh, if it's Van, then I'm... Then I'm stupid. But I, I thought it was Dan. Hold on a second. Let me look up uh, Anunnaki Dan. City of Dan. Tell Dan. Journey to the Holy Land. What is it called? City, the city of Dan. Dan, an ancient city. So all the different members of the landing party that came down from the Anunnaki, they, they were all specialists. And uh, I... I want to say his, you know, was construction, large construction. But don't quote me on that. So in the Sumerian documents, he is mentioned. And now this point, it looks like it's way out near Jerusalem because they refer to him in this being holy land stuff. But they were very long lived. Yeah, way out here. Let's see if I can find any other sites with Dan. Type in Anunnaki Dan. Uh, there's just that Anunnaki. Three discoveries at Dan, Bible archaeology, Dan, ancient city. Covering Dan, Bible map Dan. Northern city of ancient Israel. Now, this saying women in the Bible. 
I assumed Dan was a male. Tell Dan. That's still over there. Let's see Dan in Mesopotamia. Mm. So that place we were at first, Eridu. Okay. Um Thought a minute ago where they were talking about Eridu. <clears throat> I'm reading Wikipedia. Sumerian. Earliest known usages of the term Anunnaki come from the inscriptions written during the reign of Judea. Sounds like a cheese. And, and the third dynasty of Ur, which we were at in the earliest text, the term is applied to the most powerful and important deities in the Sumerian panth pantheon. The descendants of the sky god An, this group of... Uh, Deities probably included the seven gods who decree who are uh, An, Anu, king of Nibiru, Enlil, his son, Enki, I believe it's another son, Ninhursag, I think that's a wife, Nana, could be wrong, could be one of the wives, Utu, and Anana, who's definitely a female. So, but that's not all. Then they had uh, 50 other or more other specialists in the landing party. Uh, all the certain deities are described as members of the Anunnaki. No complete list of the names of all the Anunnaki has survived. Again, we have oh, at least 50. They are only uh, referred to as a cohesive, they, and they are usually only referred to as a cohesive group in literary texts. Furthermore, Sumerian texts describe the Anunnaki inconsistently and do not agree on how many Anunnaki there were or what their divine function was. Uh, it was for gold. I don't know that there was anything really divine about it. Originally, the Anunnaki appear to have been heavily, uh, heavenly deities with immense powers. In the poem Enki and the World Order, the Anunnaki do homage to Enki, sing hymns of praise in his honor and take up their dwellings among the people of Sumer. Same composition twice states that the Anunnaki decree the fates of mankind. Well, that's a lot of not anything that, you know, of course, with their spaceships and all kinds of stuff, they're going to seem like gods. I talked about what happened at uh, Gaza with Inanna and going into southern Africa and getting killed and then resurrected. This uh, document I'm looking at here on uh, the Anunnaki has this thing in highlighted in blue. Anana's descent into the netherworld. Virtually every major deity in the Sumerian pantheon was regarded as the patron of a specific city uh, and was ex expected to protect that city's interests. The deity was believed to permanently reside within that city's temple, and they did at one point before transitioning. This is me speaking, not wiki, uh, where they transferred everything to humans. One text mentions as many as 50 Anunnaki associated with the city of Eridu. There's 50. In Anana's descent into the netherworld, there are only seven Anunnaki who reside within the underworld and serve as judges. Anana stands trial before them for her attempt to take over the underworld, and they deem her guilty of hubris and condemn her to death. Now, the other story goes is that she was in Egypt. Marduk was causing a whole bunch of problems. He created a, There was a scandal between two lovers. One of the lovers fled into Africa to get away from the scandal, and he died in the process of an as an accident. Died of an accident while going into Africa. So that caused a giant crap show. Anana gets mad. She goes to recover the body. Something happens where she ends up in southern Africa, where another Anunnaki faction lives and controls all the, the mining down in southern Africa. But even at that point, this faction of the Anunnaki is evil. Just evil, 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 evil. So they capture her, and they kill her. 
and that causes great unrest all throughout the other Anunnaki territories and all the way up to Nibiru, their planet. And the word comes down and an entity, either an android or something, an entity is dispatched down to Southern Africa to resurrect her body. And then she jumps in her flying chip, jet, airplane thing, and she flies back to Egypt and start, starts firing missiles at the pyramids as she's calling her brothers and family members to come in and start raising war, raging, waging war on Marduk, trapping him in the Great Pyramid where he engages in warfare against them. And that's shortly after that, he gets deposed and all the power hub of him being in, the leader of the Anunnaki at that point in time, he's deposed and he becomes Amun-Ra. Anyway, so Alexander got red-pilled with all the Amun-Ra story in Egypt. And now he's had to make his way down into here, into the heart of the matter, and, and learn the rest of the story. And it's at these points from here on after you're going to hear about the discontent and the split between him and his people as he starts adopting these ways. But they don't know even what you and I know. There may have been rumors, who knows, but it seems like it was never, it was never controlled. And I think that that was a big mistake. And I don't know. Maybe if he leveled with all those people and they understood a little bit more. But this is all very hush-hush stuff, I, I would think, is, you know. These are all priest kings and secret knowledge, secret societies, secret groups. Specific bloodlines that are in charge from these Anunnaki. All right. Um... Okay. Let's find out where we're at. Three thousand sent by Antipater. His army, including the reinforcements that had arrived the previous year at Babylon, now numbered something in the ballpark of thirty thousand heavy infantry, seven thousand light infantry, and missile troops and 6,500 cavalry, a total of 43,500. The departure of the Greek forces, however, encouraged the Macedonian contingents to think that they would also be returning home, and many even began making preparations for the journey. Alexander, though, had already begun planning to take his army further east than any Greek had gone before, and made an impassioned speech to his men. He pointed out that although they had successfully conquered much of the Persian Empire, the subjects had still not been subdued, and that there were many other nations who would threaten their gains if they turned back now. In Alexander's view, we must either give up what we have taken, or we must seize what we do not yet hold. It would not be the last time that Alexander would have to make such a speech. Nevertheless, Alexander's words, alongside even more generous payments to his soldiers, ensured their loyalties. With Bessus having fled to Bactria, Alexander began a slow pursuit, aiming to subjugate the remaining Persian provinces en route, starting with Hyrcania. After some minor skirmishes, Alexander was met by a group of Persian nobles, including Nebazanes, the satrap of Hyrcania, and one of Bessus's co-conspirators. Bessus's coup had been hastily carried out, and since he had retreated towards Bactria, Hyrcania had been left almost deserted, with Alexander's army on their doorstep. Nabazanes saw the writing on the wall and surrendered. The remaining Greek mercenaries under Patron, that had served Darius, had also fled to Hyrcania, and they too sent envoys to Alexander, offering terms of surrender, an offer which Alexander accepted, adding another 1,500 to his army. As part of Nabazanes' surrender, he also gave a number of gifts to Alexander, one of which was a young eunuch called Bagoes. 
Bagoas, we are told, had previously been a favorite of Darius's. And oh my god. A favorite and lover of Alexander. Yeah, oh my god. Such relationships were by no means rare among Macedonian kings, as Archelaus I and Philip II both also had younger male lovers. Oh my god. Now, Bazanis was aware of this and gifted Bagoas to Alexander with instructions that the eunuch would endear himself to the king in order to make the surrender as smooth as possible. But he's a eunuch. The intent, then it oh my god. With Just a manservant, maybe? What the? Alexander next subjugated Oops. the Mardians, defeating an army of 8,000 of them in the process. The Mardians <laughs> were renowned horsemen, and Alexander took many of their horses as tribute to replace the thousands that had so far been lost. Though the campaign was progressing well, Alexander's growing Persianization was starting to become a problem. He had taken to wearing elements of Persian dress, including the Persian royal diadem, accepted Asians into his court, gave Persian cloaks to his companions to wear, indulged more and more in Persian luxuries, and even ordered that 30,000 Persian boys be taught Greek and the Macedonian style of fighting. For the ancient authors, this Persianization was a source of serious criticism against Alexander. You know, and they he's won everything and they, they should have trusted him to there. And again, maybe it's just too much for them to handle. They should have... It's like they don't know the big picture. You shouldn't be offended by the clothes or just remove all the crap that has happened with all the rulers since the Anunnaki time. Who's supposed to be in charge, running the show out here, and uh, helping build civilization and advance humankind and do it where there's the, the most peace and prosperity for everybody. Truth, justice, and the Macedonian way. Okay. It seems that all these kings down here up to this point they are being ridiculed by the Anunnaki and sometimes possibly being forced to go to war just to destroy them. Okay, so... I think as people should have been cool understanding that oh, this is what we're coming from, the big picture of, of, of what we're coming from. So don't get offended by the clothing. I mean, you know, when in Greece, uh, when in Rome, but Rome wasn't really around, I don't think, so much at the time. Um, maybe. Okay. So I think maybe if they knew more of the story, but then again, again, there maybe their minds couldn't handle it. You know, they don't want to hear about aliens from another world they don't need to know about that maybe i don't know but it starts unraveling between him and his people but he did say hey we're gonna set up games and we're gonna start teaching all of these kids our ways and they should all been like hell yeah we're this is we're the ones that are supposed to be in charge of all of this and advanced humankind now and it's it's you know it's been decreed and everything seems to indicate up to this point that that's the way it's supposed to be you are supposed to be in charge uh yeah and so he starts becoming more and more persianized as they say but, but you're talking about the very, very first moments of anything like technology and civilization is, is happening. It happened here. So for them to not understand that as well, I don't get. You know, you may be from Macedon, but you've been considered, you've been called a barbarian by everybody. Even the Greeks are, you know, in bloodlines of things. They're still tied, blah, 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 blah. And they, all, all these people out here, consider these people dummies and barbarians. And Alexander's one of them. 
but still bloodline, blah, 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 blah. They should have still acknowledged that as time went on, somehow or another, the, uh, the Anunnaki spread them out and put all them, you know, sent people out here to do operations out here and whatever, wherever. That's the way I look at it today, too. And it's unfortunate that there's so many hostilities between the uh, Eastern world in this in this place and the Western world. They think that they still, may, you know, maybe they control all the secrets and they control all the, the ancient power, but they really have nothing as we've been flying around. I mean, there's nothing going on in these ancient places. They got wiped out after the flood, but everything's like still 12th century, in my opinion, with the current Anunnaki rulers, human... Uh, rulers in these in these places there's reports of uh, Alexander as he gets out and uh, starts going into India over here being attacked by UFOs and stuff and that fits right in with the crazy 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 histories of the Indian Hindu people. Crazy. It's, it's, this is the story about flying cities and thunderbolts. They could throw thunderbolts and lightning. Very, very frightening. And when you look at some of the cities that, that we're allowed to see now, and we're not allowed to see still quite a bit, but they've allowed us now on YouTube to have people go in and uh, and they've a lot of these places have shown up on ancient aliens. Some of these cities that are built are, you know, your eyes are going to freak out. Your eyes kind of flicker in your head like, oh, my God, your, you know, brain spasm trying to comprehend the work that went into these places. Anyway, we do have to make one more stop. Uh, let's continue with the story a little bit while I go try to find Baalbek. Uh, because Alexander did go that there, and Gilgamesh did go there. That back over here. And even during Alexander's lifetime, it was divisive. Some of his officers, namely his childhood friends like Hephaestion and Ptolemy, were welcoming of blending Persian and Hellenic cultures. But the older officers in Alexander's army, who had served under Philip, such as Parmenion, his son Philotus and Cletus the Black were more critical. It would prove to be a dangerous divide. Following his conquests of Hyrcania and Mardia, Alexander pushed further east towards Bactria. The Parthian satrap quickly submitted to Alexander, as did the satrap of Arya, Satipazanes. Shortly after Alexander had left Arya, though, Satipazanes killed the Macedonian garrison stationed there and tried to incite a revolt, forcing Alexander to quickly double back to protect his rear. Just two days after the revolt began, Alexander had arrived on the scene. Satipazanes himself managed to escape to Bactria with 2,000 cavalry, but the troops he left behind were quickly surrounded by Alexander and killed. Alexander pushed on, taking Drangiana and preparing to spend the winter there. It was at this point that the division between Philip's older officers and Alexander's first became a major problem in a series of events well known as the Philotus Affair. One of the royal pages, Dimnus, planned a conspiracy to assassinate Alexander. Amongst those involved were Demetrius, one of Alexander's personal bodyguards, and Nicomachus, Dimnus's lover. Nicomachus in turn told his brother, Cybelinus, about the plot who immediately took the information to Philotus, the commander of Alexander's companions. Philotus's brother had recently died, and his grief may have affected his decision, but for whatever reason, Philotas decided not to inform Alexander. Frustrated, Cebelinus instead went to a different officer, who arranged for an audience between Alexander and Cebelinus, who told him about the plot. Alexander immediately sent soldiers to round up the conspirators, Dimnus killing himself before he could be captured, but the others being taken alive. Philotas was also seized. Philotas defended himself, saying that he had genuinely believed it to be just gossip, but also recognized that he had been mistaken. 
Alexander initially accepted this and forgave Philotas, but later consulted his most trusted officers about the matter. Though Philotas was a talented cavalry commander, he was not particularly popular with many of his peers, who often considered him arrogant and obnoxious, and were jealous of his powerful position. They all turned on him, convincing Alexander that Philotas must be put on trial, and also suggesting that if Philotas was involved, his father Parmenion likely was as well. The following day, Philotas, and by extension Parmenion, was put on trial for treason. Philotas defended himself well, pointing out that neither Dimnus nor Nicomachus had ever implicated him, and that there was no evidence against him, that when Cebellinus approached him about the plot, he made no attempt to silence him, and that he had no real motive, again insisting that he only made an admittedly bad mistake. Nevertheless, it was clear that his fate had effectively already been decided. In the council following the trial, Craterus, Hephaestion, and Coenus convinced Alexander and the other officers that Philotas should be tortured for more information. Craterus, Hephaestion, and Coenus had all fought alongside Philotas for years, and Coenus was even his brother-in-law. Nevertheless, it was these three that personally oversaw the torture, some sources also claiming that Alexander listened to the torture from the other side of a curtain. After many hours of brutal torture, Philotas eventually confessed to having been involved in the plot, also naming his father Parmenion as a conspirator. All the named conspirators, including Philotas, were executed, and two of Alexander's companions, Cleander and Sitalkes, were sent to race back to Ecbatana to kill Parmenion. When they arrived, that's so sad. A letter to Parmenion, citing his son's crimes before assassinating him. That is so sad. The general's death. The soldiers at Ecbatana almost immediately erupted into. Pro yeah, I would too. I mean, that's super unfortunate and a really big mistake. But again, we're not Alexander. We can't know. We can't know. But it's such. It's so sad because in every battle, Parmenion's always outnumbered on the left flank, and he always holds his own and does his part, him and his son, and they are always successful in, in making sure that that side doesn't collapse and that the center, yeah, that, you know, that whole wing is protected. So... He's there, his son's over there talking crap, he doesn't understand what's going on. They get in this big fight, and they think there's this conspiracy, and I, I you know, whatever it is, it's just, it's just really sad. Because you want to see everybody after all this, you know, now become the other people that start running the show in all of these places. Uh, thank you to um, Benja YT for coming in and to Lone Star Aviator. And I'm sorry if I missed you in the chat. Uh, I was, you know, really heads down trying to keep all this together and keep uh, keep the narrative going. I have found Baalbek. Okay. We'll get back to this in just a moment. To make sure that I have the right controls this time. Okay, it's right underneath us. If I have it right. But sometimes the, the computer generates buildings over the terrain in an attempt to 
show you what it thinks is a building there. And sometimes it gets it terribly wrong. Now let's just pause it here and see if that works. Okay. Does that work? Good. Okay. All right. What I'm looking for is, I was going to say, look for the pillars. Look for the pillars. The pillars are so tall that you should be able to spot pillar shadow. And I see some right there. And they talk about six or more that are still standing. And that's the best we can do is assume that those are pillars. Unless we find something, uh, unless we definitively find some of the old pillars in the area. Okay. This is the, this area, what, what, what we're, what we're trying to, get at here is this complex all right this is believed to be an anunnaki space port a loading and launching facility potentially for the anunnaki there could be a pillar set down there But normally you can see distinctly like six major ones. But another amazing feature about fallback, aside from, and I, it, I'm hoping um, it hasn't been too destroyed with Taliban and people in there. They love destroying ancient history. Instead of opening up the world, to come in and explore the wonders that existed here and we should all be living in peace and everybody should be seeing kumbaya and you really wish that all that the people that control this part of the world now would do is invest their time into world peace and getting all the money through people that are interested in coming and doing archaeology on Anunnaki sites. All right, so the other wonder about this this area. The stones in the pyramid are approximately two tons each. There are three stones, three rectangle stone, uh, rectangle blocks of stone that are put into place 30 or more feet into the air on one of these structures. That are 1,700 tons. And they're stacked, uh, one, the one and two are stacked right side by side lengthwise. And then a third one is stacked on top of that. And I guess they are up elevated 30 feet or more into the air. And there's another one that you may have seen in the ground in pictures where a bunch of people st are standing on it and they hadn't fully finished carving it out yet. 1,700 tons. So Alexander the Great did come through here to see this place for himself. The Romans had come all this way too. When the Romans were in control, the Romans came right here and established a temple to Jupiter. Gilgamesh came up here because this we wanted to find out more about if it was true that there was ancient sites, an ancient launching facility, an ancient structure that the Anunnaki built. And here's where he encountered the guardian 
an ancient guardian of the Anunnaki, possibly an android or a machine. We don't know. But the thing's name was Humbaba. Humbaba. And Alexander, uh, Alexander, uh, Gilgamesh and his partner in Kidu. had to take him on and they do defeat him and and i really don't i'm not you know i i'm no expert on gilgamesh at all and that's really just the the uh the new version that i understand now what happened after that i couldn't tell you the details what was the outcome of all that where did he go next so i will have to reread or you know i know very little about gilgamesh so i'll have to just really delve into it one of these days and get to the nuts and bolts of exactly what happened but um, either coming or going, Alexander came here too. So this is a very, very important, important site to validate the existence and operations. Because again, here, just, you know, take Alexander and go, okay, look at those three stones. <laughs> you think any of us in anywhere that we've been so far, other than these ancient, ancient, ancient tech, you know, sites could do this? No. No. When I think back of the, the way that they're living in Macedonia and what their structures look like and what their cities look like, and, you know, they're all rather quaint, but, you know, nothing like the splendor of what these places would have been. Okay. Okay. protest until Cleander and Sitocles read out the letter detailing the crimes of Philotus. Sad, sad, this, sad. The soldiers demanded that Parmenion be given a funeral with full military honors, a request Heck that yes. allowed. The obvious question is, was there any truth in the accusation that Philotus was involved? The most probable scenarios are that Philotus either allowed the plot to happen but was not involved in the planning, or that he genuinely thought that the conspiracy was not a serious threat and made a fatal error in judgment by not informing Alexander. Either way, the affair gave Alexander and his officers the perfect opportunity to clean the house. Sad. Sad. One of the most experienced, talented, and popular officers under Alexander's command and was crucial to the victories at Issus and Gorgamela. Similarly, Philotas had played an important role in Alexander's victories at Thebes, Miletus, and notably at the Persian Gates just months earlier. Nevertheless, they were both part of the Old Guard, having served under Philip. Both had criticized Alexander, Philotas even supposedly boasting in the past that he and his father deserved more of the credit than Alexander. Both were in incredibly powerful positions within the Macedonian army and Alexander may have thought it too dangerous to have them in such grand positions without being able to entirely trust them. Alexander's officers had their own motivations. In the case of Coenus in particular, it appears likely that, because of his relation by marriage to Philotus, he was quick to distance himself from any accusations of also being involved, being one of the first to condemn his brother-in-law. The other officers were all ambitious men, and Philotus and Parmenion were both barriers to their careers. The two dead men would not, however, be directly replaced. Rather than risk having one man having command of such a large portion of the army, Alexander instead seems to have preferred to split their powers between numerous other officers, command of the companions being split between Cletus the Black and Hephaestion, merging the old guard with the new. Never underestimate the power of... Mm -hmm. The Philotas affair and subsequent reorganization had cost Alexander precious time, and so, despite it being winter, Alexander left Trangiana, determined to cross the Hindu Kush and hatch Bessus. The satrap of Arya was once again stirred up to revolt by Seti Pisanes, who had entered the province with 2,000 cavalry. However, this time Alexander would suffer no delays, pushing onwards and sending Eregius, one of his close friends, to put down the revolt. 
which he did after a difficult battle in which Satipazanes was killed by Eregius personally. Alexander quickly subdued Aracosia, founding a city in the area in the process before reaching the Hindu Kush, probably sometime in April 329. The two-week-long crossing of the mountains was difficult, Alexander and his men trudging through deep mountain snow. Many of his men suffered from frostbite, some went snowblind, while others mm. simply perished from the cold. Alexander, however, had chosen to take this particularly dangerous route into Bactria, specifically because it would outflank Bessus in Ionus. This plan worked. Bessus, alarmed by Alexander's rapid advance, abandoned the province, taking what army he could and crossing the Oxus into Sogdiana, destroying any resources he could in the process to try and slow the Macedonians. Alexander quickly set about subduing the area, easily storming and taking the major cities of Bactria. In June, before leaving for the river Oxus, Alexander dismissed those who were either too old or whose time of service had been completed, rewarding them handsomely. Among them were the remnants of the Thessalian cavalry. Some of these men had returned home the previous year. Some had died. Leave I'm sorry, I wanted to quickly show you on the map just how far they're talking about here. When they talk about him going to the Hindu Kush, right? I just punched in the URL for the Hindu Kush, and let me zoom out. Let me set that as a, a departure point, whatever. But let me keep zooming out. Jalalabad. Okay. But now let's try to find where we were. Okay, here's where we were looking in the Persian Gulf down here at those sites. There's Baghdad, there's Tehran, so we were north of here. I think he was dealing, I think we just said that he was dealing with the whole Darius thing up in here. And now he's over here making his way. He talked about his men being snow blind, freezing to death. I hope we get high detailed maps of these places. But just to get a look at the place, we've got it pegged now, so let's let's take a look from the air. And we're going to be in one of those right there. The A5 Icon. Oh, folks, if you uh, have never flown and you're like, where do I even begin, Kineas, with learning to fly? And I need you to make it as easy as possible. Look, because, you know, I'm afraid when I get into the, these planes that you've been showing me, like the Cessna 152 and 172, there's so much going on can you, that I can't, my brain is overwhelmed. There's no way you're going to teach me how to fly using something like that. I get it. Completely. I understand that so well. So, before I hit, it looks like we're in 8-bit uh, land, the way the map is and the way it lays out the patterns, we're in 8-bit we're in land, or whatever it is, that uh, pixel land. Okay, pause. Look at this cockpit. If you didn't know we were in an airplane, just blank your mind for a minute. Close your eyes and open your eyes. Close them for like three or four or five seconds. And then open your eyes. Okay. If that's what you just suddenly woke up to. Would your first thought be that you're in an airplane? So you start looking at the dials a little bit more closely. Airspeed. Altitude. Okay, I'm used to the fuel and my oil and my temperatures, and there's my RPM. AOA, what is that? And then the compass in the middle, right? You've got some other things. Purge, build, land aircraft, blah, 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 blah. 
Okay, but again, the first thought isn't. The first thought isn't I'm in an aircraft. The first thought is I'm in a car. You look down here, there's the start key. Look, there's some... Are, is one of those the clutch? No, they're actually your rudder pedals down there. What? I'm in a seaplane too. I can transition. Using this lever right here. Pull it down and we drop our wheels. If not, put our wheels up and we can land on water. There's our flaps. Landing lights, taxi lights, navigation lights, strobe lights, a bilge pump for when we're in the water, a heater because it can get cold. And we want to just lower our water rudder. Okay, we've got some other radios here. And we've got this cool GPS. We have no autopilot with this plane. But that's fine. You still have everything a growing pilot needs. Including 3D vision. Which, man, that's just a marvel right there. Easy to set up flight plans. Touch to add a waypoint. Simple as that. Oh, I can just type it in? You're kidding. Really? That's, that's cool. Okay. Nearest airports. Nearest airports. Nearest VORs. NDBs or inter intersections. Okay. Let's pull up airports, the nearest airport. Really? No near airports? We'll give it a minute. There it goes. Jalalabad is the nearest one. We turn to a bearing of 215. It's 43.7 nautical miles. 6,678 feet for the runway. <clears throat> okay. Hmm. So if, let's just say we want to go there, click it. This D with the arrow is always direct to. Go directly to that thing. Or insert a flight plan. So normally you just want the, the daredevil with the arrow pointing through it. Direct to. Go right to it. Good. And it'll set you up with everything. Then activate or cancel it. And you can add other things in here. Activate it. Check that. Okay. So then go out to the map and see if we got it. Yeah, we do. So now we got all we got to do is follow the course, and you can touch screen that to see what's ahead of you and look at the terrain. It's quite a ways. Okay, you can zoom in and out. Let's do that. A little bit more. There we go. So what an amazing sport plane we're in. Okay, now uh, another thing. You don't need any more than a driver's license. At least when they first created this, you don't need any you don't need any more than a driver's license to fly this. And in 15 to 20 minutes or at least an hour, you will absolutely feel that you can fly. I can fly. I knew I could fly. I knew I was one of those people who was born to fly. I can fly this thing. It's so easy. Oh, that's just, if I want to throttle, spin, turn, it's so forgiving. Even if I stall and let go of the controls, it's made in such a way that when it stalls, it resists a stall, and it, it really won't let you stall. It's trying to save your life at any given moment. Look at the height of some of these mountains that were around whoa look at the size of this looking down over here i got all scared i'm like dude how high up are we it's like we're looking into ripples and looking down into craters like higher so this is where his men are trying to penetrate into india And they're getting all kinds of messed up. By the way, um, mountain flying is scary. Because the way the winds move up and down the sides of mountains, um, you'll be required to take a special class on that. And if you're going to want to fly around mountains a lot, you're going to go on, you want to go to YouTube and... Uh, Go on to the uh, 
Just find anything you can on mountain flying. And then they'll give you a crash course and things you need to really be aware of. In my earlier days messing around, flying around with uh, in Colorado, I killed myself over and over and over and over. I've died a thousand times trying to work my way through mountain ranges. I've gone into some valleys like I'm, I'm like, okay, I'll go down through here and I'll I'll cut through here and all of a sudden there's no there's no wind. The way that the, the terrain is set up in such a way that it's like a zone of no wind at that time of day or whatever. A pocket of no wind. And there's nothing you can do. You just fall out of the sky. There's no wind. You can't I mean you can dive and try to generate whatever lift you can, but for the most part there's no way to really get lift. And so unless you're really good at emergency landings, but then with all the trees, blah, blah, blah. It's a strange phenomena. My dad sold his plane when I was a teenager before I got to learn how to fly for real. And knowing me, I would have killed myself. So yeah, I, I really... I'm glad that it didn't happen. I'm not going to lament it. I have for a long time. But the crazy guy that bought the plane, and he was 1970s guy kind of crazy. Mr. Bounce, chicka, wow, wow. You know, one of those dudes. Seriously. Snort, snort, sniff. Uh, bought my dad's plane and then proceeded to crash it into Pikes Peak in Colorado, you know, uh, west of um, Colorado Springs up on the mountain. Killing everybody on board. Okay, so this is the Hindu Kush. And there's a lot of other things, just the as the name implies. Hindu Kush. Says it all. So I had wonder. I wonder if they have had run into it before here. And I'm talking about certain plants and uh, that are used for other purposes, adult entertainment purposes. Uh, how much of it was available, if at all, beyond these points earlier in the day? I know that Silk was all, you know, pretty much getting ready to at least move, start moving through the area, and it may have already been. I'm guessing it was. So, so Silk was making it all the way out from the Far East. And I don't have a... This plane isn't powerful enough to, to to do the job of getting into these. But yeah, poor Alexander. Having to now... The challenges of discovering more and more and more about the truth of things with these Anunnaki. It becomes super challenging. It is like climbing Olympus at this point to get to the information you need to validate everything. And him seeing that as it, oh, that's a true test to, of your deityhood if you're strong enough to, like it was in uh, Egypt. Are you strong enough to make it to the temple? So having that mentality come, you know, I got to keep going. I, I, I am strong enough to make it to the temple, the next temple, in the next temple. Okay. And we'll see if we can get to a spot where we can land the icon, and I'll show you how easy it is to land the thing.
Uh, but before I actually, I've got it up on the screen, but I haven't hit play yet. Let me kind of cover that really quickly. This plane will teach you and make you feel that you can fly. And it's so designed so well that within an hour, you will be convinced that you know how to fly. Okay. And you, you'd be like, I, I can fly. It happens to us all. It's so wonderful and so simple and so easy that within an hour or two, you will have a, uh, an overconfident situation. And you'll push it a little harder than you're supposed to push it. And at this point, with just a driver's license and no practical flying experience and understanding the physics of flying and what can happen to you below 3,000 feet, all the crazy ass situations that can happen. And at that point, you will die. So let that be a warning if you're a rich person and you're like, wow, Kenny said I can go out and fly an icon in an hour. I know how to fly. Hopefully you didn't tune out before this part. Where I say the odds are now stacked against you once you hit that point of con where you're confident. The chances, I think, of you dying are exponential at that point. What you need to do at that point, before that point happens and you kill yourself, as people are doing in the icon. And it's giving it a bad name. And I'm sorry to say that. That's such a sad thing to have to say. Uh, but in the simulator, I've been there. I've experienced it. And once I then concentrate, I'm like, okay, well, I want to learn how to fly for real. And started watching every video I could on YouTube that was dealing with the physics of flight, everything. Just, just stop. Just don't stop. Just absorb everything you can on the nuts and bolts of learning to fly. Take advantage of every software training or in the old fsx there was lots of great training videos and training missions that you could do lots and lots and lots in the old fsx anyway there's a video out there for everything and once you learn how to fly then then i think you'll uh your chances of dying in the icon at that point drop to 10 percent instead of it being up in the 80s and 90s. So, if it's exciting enough and you don't kill yourself in it, learn how to fly, learn how to do instrument flying, learn as much as you can about flying, and spend lots and lots and lots of time in the simulator. Because you've got to hit those moments. You've got to hit those moments of where you think you're in control. And they'll come fast when you're first starting. Moments where you're going to feel, I, I can do this, I can do this, where everything goes right. But the more you do it, and the more you do it, and the more you do it, and imagining you're doing it for real and trying to do it, ex doing it by the book, stuff happens. And you've got to be able to know how to get out. It's Doing the Microsoft Flight Simulator it isn't like, oh, okay, I, I know how to fly now. Nothing will ever go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> pardon me, but whether you want it to or not, you can set things to go wrong. I'm such a good pilot. I have to set crap to go wrong so that I can experience emergency situations. I do fine by myself. I kill myself all the time still. Okay. Leaving only a small number that had stayed on as mercenaries. These two were now dismissed with good pay. Adios. He and his army then set off, marching across the waterless and burning desert. It was a long march and cost Alexander even more men to dehydration. 
When they finally did find water, many of his soldiers, drinking too quickly, choked and died. Their troubles oh. continued when they reached the Oxus itself. Bessus had made sure to burn the boats he had used to cross the river, and the area had no timber Alexander could use for constructing other boats or bridges. Undeterred, Alexander ordered his men to cross the river, creating rafts by using skins that the soldiers used for their tents, filling them with straw and sewing them shut. This move proved the final straw for Bessus's faction. Just as Bessus had done to Darius, Bessus's nobles, led in part by a man called Spitamenes, turned on him, keeping him under guard and sending word to Alexander, informing him of events. Alexander quickly sent a force of 4,000 infantry and 1,600 cavalry, possibly under Ptolemy's command, to seize Bessus. When Bessus was captured, he was, on Alexander's orders, flogged, stripped naked and bound in a wooden collar. Alexander handed Bessus to Darius III's brother, who had his ears and nose cut off, a traditional Persian punishment, before eventually having him executed in Bactria. Alexander marched through Sogdiana, easily subduing and garrisoning cities in the area, including... All right, hold on. That was a place... I'm trying to find it, and again, the name's changed, and this one's being rather problem uh, problematic. It's called Nautica. Okay, but when I go to find it... Um, it would help if I typed it right. Nautica. It doesn't immediately come up with like a wiki page for a place. Let me type in the word ancient after it. See what it come up with. Odysseus and Nausicaa in ancient art. Turn of the ancients. An architects of the unknown wiki fandom. Uh, let me type in Nautica Alexander. The AI wants to ask, say, ask me anything. There might be some confusion here. Nautica is a well known American brand specializing in clothing. No, that's not what we want. How could Alexander the Great go there and there nothing be about it in the internet? And this AI from this co pilot AI is just being retarded. Pardon my language. It's like, like giving me a. Huh. It is telling me something that we don't know. Determined to explore the sea, Alexander ordered the construction of a glass diving bell. In early versions of a glass diving bell, the transparent chamber would allow him to. Descend into the ocean while remaining protected from the pressure and water. I saw an illustration of that and I was wondering what it was. It looked like they had, uh, like it was a barrel. And then I was like, is that a punishment? And then I saw that the guy inside is wearing the crown. And I kind of figured that he was, he had had something like that. In the French Roman story, Alexander's descent into the watery abyss, the story unfolds the third branch, the four-part text, blah, blah, blah. The world beneath the waves. Alexander encounters wonders and dangers underwater. A colossal, a colossal fish seizes his contraption, contraption, pulling him off course. Emerging from the depths, Alexander shaken. His arrogance has been humbled by the vastness of power of the sea. Perhaps now he comprehends that some domains are beyond mortal dominion. That still doesn't bring us to that place. Okay, so let me look up the next place on the map. It says Maraconda. Samarkand, Wikipedia. Mar Maraconda, Wikipedia. That says Brazilian. Man, see what I mean? Sometimes hunting down some of these ancient sites because of name changes are so difficult. Let's see what Samarakan then says.
All right, well, let's go to the uh, the location. We grab it here. It's got a long address. Very long. Do. If there is an easy way to transition from an, a flight to another point, I really need to know that. It would be so much better if I could open up a search while we're flying and just immediately go to where I need to go rather than having to go back to the main menu every single time. I think it would be a shame after all this time moving around that we don't see the actual place that this took place. I have to hurry up and wrap this show up, though. If I go too long, I can't edit the live streams in case something goes wrong copyright-wise or whatever. Okay, let me zoom in here. And let's start zooming out. Let's see if any of the names come up or anything looks... similar to the maps that we're looking at. These rivers, let's see about the rivers. Yeah. All right, well, this is at least the region. Possibly under Ptolemy's command to seize Bessus. When Bessus was captured, he was, on Alexander's orders, flogged, stripped naked, and bound in a wooden collar. Alexander handed Bessus to Darius III's brother, who had his ears and nose cut off, a traditional Persian punishment, before eventually having him executed in Bactria. Alexander marched through Sogdiana, easily subduing and garrisoning cities in the area, including Syropolis, a city founded by Cyrus the Great almost 200 years earlier, and Marikanda, the capital of the province. He also founded yet another Alexandria on the banks of the Jaxartes, Alexandria Eschati, the furthest Alexandria. It finally seemed that Alexander was the undisputed king of Persia. However, things were not as simple as they seemed. While in Sogdiana, a local tribe, numbering as many as 20,000, according to some sources, attacked Alexander's men while they were foraging before retreating to high ground. Alexander was able to use his lighter troops to storm the position and win the battle, but was badly wounded with an arrow to the leg. To make matters worse, the recently conquered provinces of Sogdiana and Bactria both rose up in rebellion, led by Spitamenes. Seven of the cities that Alexander had taken, including Syropolis, had their garrisons massacred by local tribes, while Spitamenes himself besieged Marikanda. Alexander split his army into three, a few thousand under Phanukis being sent to relieve Marikanda, more under Craterus besieging Syropolis, where most of the rebel forces were focused, while Alexander focused on storming five of the smaller cities. In doing so, he hoped to defeat the enemy in detail, damaging the morale of those in Syropolis. Alexander wasted no time besieging any of his targets. He attacked Gaza first, using his missile troops and siege engines to clear the enemy from the walls before using siege ladders to break inside and putting all the men there to the sword. The next two cities suffered the same treatment, the Macedonians using siege ladders to quickly scale the walls, once again slaughtering the males inside. The rebels in the final two cities, seeing smoke and refugees flowing from the other three, promptly abandoned their positions, many later being cut down by Alexander's cavalry. 
According to Arian, taking these five cities had taken Alexander just two days. You may not believe this, but I said some of these places are hard to find, right? This place they're talking about here, Cryopolis. The actual location of this ancient city is currently undetermined. It is speculated that Alexander the Great may have established his own guard town of Alexandria Ashate at the same location, simply renaming the Archimedes city of, of Cryopolis. Potential sites include the medieval and modern city of Kurjan in northern Tajikistan, Jizak on the Jaxartes River, and Ura Tubi, the modern day city of Erstakavashan. But it's weird to think that every place else you're able to get maps and know exactly where it's at, and we can't say. We get no URL to go to. I mean, I could probably get it. Let's pick the first place. Uh, who jammed? But they me mentioned the Dax Artie's River. I can see him doing that. Oh, let's go with that one then. Do we get coordinates? Yes, we do. Okay. Very tough. So now, yeah, now he's running into, he's going to run into new tribes, and then India. Wow, that got us. I don't know where the hell I am. That's way north of down here. That's up in this area. They're actually putting it between like some of these points out here in the middle of the water. By the way, he's going to start getting attacked throughout this region. Okay, so we'll just go with that then. That's where we're supposed to be. What? <laughs> I don't see any great cities, though, at the moment. All right, well, I'll keep that playing, and I'll look at the other locations. The Macedonian king then marched to meet Craterus at Syropolis. Filled with 15,000 rebels and with strong walls, Alexander initially planned to construct siege rams to batter the walls down. He noticed, however, that the river channel leading into Syropolis had dried, offering a passage into the city. Ordering a diversionary attack on the main fortifications, Alexander secretly led his hypaspists, Agrianians and archers up the channel and into the city. With the rebels distracted by the attack on the walls, Alexander's force was able to open the gates from the inside before being noticed and having to fall back to the marketplace. The rebels abandoned the walls, determined to kill Alexander, and fierce fighting broke out, during which Alexander was again wounded with a stone to the neck and head, which knocked him unconscious. Nevertheless, the open gates and abandoned walls allowed the rest of his army to pour into the city, and Seropolis was soon taken back, with 8,000 rebels dying in the process. The seventh and final city fell soon after to a rapid assault. 
sometime around October, Alexander moved to Alexandria Eskati, building defences around the city and settling prisoners taken from the Sogdian cities as well as some of his older troops there. However, on the other side of the river, the nomadic Saka were beginning to stir. They were simultaneously frustrated by the founding of Alexandria Eskati, which in their opinion was in their sphere of influence, and were eager to exploit the chaotic situation for their own benefit. A strong cavalry force under the command of Cathasis, brother of the Sake king, gathered on the north bank of the river. With the Bactrians and Sogdians still in revolt, Alexander had to choose to either expose his northern flank to deal with the revolt, or allow the revolt to continue but secure his borders. He chose the latter, hoping to defeat the Scythian threat before it grew in size. Alexander, his leg still healing and his voice ragged from the wound at Seropolis, amassed his army on the bank opposite the Seca, to the northeast of Alexandria Eskati. He once again ordered his men to prepare rafts to cross the river, in the same manner as they had at the Oxus. Before the battle began, however, a Sakan ambassador arrived, insisting that Alexander withdraw his force and warning him, Beware, lest while you strive to reach the top, you fall with the very branches you have grasped. Even the lion has sometimes been the food of the smallest bird, and rust consumes iron. Alexander dismissed the ambassador and prepared his army for battle the following day. The exact numbers on either side are unknown. However, due to there being almost no mention of Alexander's phalanx in the battle, we can presume that he only took his lighter troops and cavalry, approximately 9,000 of the former and 6,000 of the latter. We can only guess at the size of the Saka force, but given the fact that no source mentions it being significantly larger or smaller, it was likely of comparable size, composed purely of cavalry. The Sake had deployed themselves as close as possible to the river on the other bank, hoping to stop the Macedonians before they could set foot on their side. Alexander, however, set up siege weapons to fire at them from across the river, a tactic he had pioneered during his Illyrian campaign. These missiles forced the Sake to withdraw out of range, and Alexander then gave the order for his army to begin the crossing. Men on the front of the makeshift rafts knelt, providing a screen with their shields and protecting those who were rowing from the hail of arrows as they closed in on the Sake's bank. Once they reached the other side, Alexander's Agrianians and archers immediately attacked the Sake, providing covering fire for the cavalry and infantry to disembark. Nevertheless, in order to secure victory, Alexander would have to find a way of pinning the enemy's nimble all-cavalry army. Just as he had done previously at the Granicus, Alexander decided to make a tactical sacrifice to gain an advantage. About 1,000 footmen and a portion of the auxiliary cavalry were sent forward to attack. The Saka deftly avoided their charge, surrounding the small force, riding in circles and firing arrows into their midst. This was precisely what Alexander had wanted. Gathering his cavalry, Hypaspists, Agrianians and other light infantry, Alexander advanced. As he closed in, a detachment of the companions and light cavalry were sent to charge the Saka on the flanks of his surrounded men while he led the light infantry and the rest of the companions in an attack on their center. Alexander had now successfully pinned a large portion of the Saka force, and many were killed in the ensuing fight. It had been a brilliant display of Alexander's combined arms tactics. The entire Saka force quickly began to withdraw, pursued by Alexander and his cavalry. Eventually, though, a mixture of nightfall, fatigue and diarrhea caused by the local water forced Alexander to call off the pursuit. Approximately 1,000 Saka had been killed and a further 150 captured, while by Rufus's account, Alexander had lost 160 with a further 1,000 wounded. A peace offering was soon sent to Alexander by the Scythian king and Alexander, in no position to continue a war on this front, accepted. Alexander had now secured his borders. Nonetheless, within his own borders there was still trouble. Bactria and Sogdiana had still not been completely subdued. Spitamenes had withdrawn from Marikanda when Phanicus had closed in, but he was still at large, a thorn in Alexander's side. 
Moreover, there was still growing discontent in Alexander's own ranks from older officers who had served under Philip. We'll cover these topics and more in the following episodes, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members. Okay, I found a map that goes over his Indian campaign. It is so hard for me to nail down. There's like thousands of miles between these two points that I'm trying to find where they're saying this might be the location, but then like a thousand miles over here could be the location. That's too much ground, but I found another map. And uh, it doesn't seem like he, I mean, he goes all the way to the edge of the Himalayas on the north on the northwest side it's like he's every time he's trying to advance forward going north east he's running into mountain ranges he can't even deal with they're just too high and he has to keep going north and east and then mountain ranges that are just too high he doubles back and he's going south and going around the south to see if he can get through the mountains and he kind of makes a little breakthrough and then oh my god there's another hundred miles of mountain that there's just no way we can get across so he turns south and then he names a town after his horse Bucephala in Nicaea let's see if we can find that point and then he names another place Alexandria way way south let's see uh Let's put us in, let me see if I can find the place that's like high in the Himalayans where he's like, oh my god. There's no way we're going to get out of this. Aornos. A-O-R-N-O-S. See if we can nail down this place. Good, we've got some coordinates. All right. And it's just a two simple, two simple numbers 31 to 74 This seems, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> this seems to be the furthest that he was able to advance northeast into this region. And again, look at these mountains out in front of him. And look at how they're going to just keep going. These are the, the Himalayas. So I don't know, we'll have to, I'll have to do a little bit more research on when he started running into a, like UFO and stuff. That would probably be, I'm imagining that is in here. But I'll have to double check. So he or the historian, somebody somewhere along the lines it has reported that as he was making his way and doing his stuff over here, he never went further around it like this. He kept coming south. He gave up. Started doubling back. Um, silvery silver discs giant silver discs that had flame around the rims and that they shot fire and that's pretty insane but it's all par for the course when you're dealing with these anunnaki stories so he's just gonna flat give up you know that's uh if he's getting the full story, he's, he's going to learn that there's another faction that's supposedly, supposedly in charge of this half of the world, this area. And he's from the original landing party, and he might be the leader, the ultimate leader of the Anunnaki landing party, that this area of the world was all of his to control over here. This is territory. 
So it would make sense that Alexander would come up here and realize, oh, you know what? There's a, if the stories are correct, there's a king that runs this area who's part of the original group that is putting me in power who is supposed to run really everything but is predominantly in control over here. He's the guy in charge and nobody should advance any further than this. My jurisdiction ends here. The day my jurisdiction ends here. And that's some humble pie. Because now you're dealing with potentially an entity that is, you know, he's he's supposed to be the king of the the, the king, the king, the king. Okay. So Tomorrow, we'll pick it back. I think we'll try to hurry up through here and find the UFO battles. And then he's going to come, I think, all the way back either to Susa or he's going to come all the way back to Babylon. Uh, I think he comes all the way back to Babylon. Baghdad. Way out here, all the way back. And then things are really gonna go bad. Poor fella. And then they talk about Ptolemy taking over uh, Egypt to, con to start running things over here. And I don't know where the rest of his generals go. We can try to find that out. And one of the guys that he put in charge of a city-state right out here in the middle of somewhere with only one eyeball up in here. He ends up, like, becoming the next ruler of everything. Down in here, he ends up being, like, the main guy. All right. Uh, let me at least... Show you how fun it is to. We'll go to Kuwait for a moment. Got me? Kuwait City. Where's your airport? Okay, so going back to the icon real quick before we end the show. Thank you. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this. I, I, I am enjoying this immensely. Now that I've spent the last few years just learning to fly, not caring about, oh, I'm using Microsoft Flight Simulator to just sightsee everything and never learn anything about flying. I made sure I learned how to fly first. Con find myself to Colorado, uh, the Colorado area, and then the United States, and now we're finally breaking away. And um, exploring the world and seeing all these sites for the very first time, and this is exciting stuff to me. Okay. The gear is down already. The flaps are down already. And all we need to do is manage our airspeed using the throttle. That's it. And, you know, just make our way down the runway. If we look out, we're, um, if you look at this thing. You sit very low to the ground, and in airplanes, it can be really unnerving to people to be sitting higher up and not really being able to see the ground. So, definitely more like a car in that respect. Oops, of course. All right, so you they take, you know, you don't have to pay a whole lot of attention to your dials you just need to float down to the runway have enough power 
keep it in the green. And with the flaps up like this, you move really, really slow. You can go very, very, very slow. Of course. She'll hold together pretty well in a dive. You want to be careful. You don't want to overstress the plane too bad, but she's a sport plane, so she's meant to have a little bit of fun with. That's where people get dangerous and they put, push her a little too hard. So try to think of it more like a flying car than a plane. And I think it will do fine at that point. If you really think about it that way, it's this is a flying car. You'll do much better. Very easy to control your altitude and hold it. You're not bouncing up. It's very stable. It really puts you in control. Now, on landing, the one of the techniques that everybody uses is they say, don't look right in front of you. Don't look right at the ground. You know, don't look right out the window. You're supposed to always focus your attention all the way at the furthest point of the runway. Okay, that's how you, that's where you should keep your eyes. Keep your eyes all the way as far as you can look down the runway and bring your speed down. And just keep your nose slowly easing up. You don't want to push up too hard, but keep your nose lined up for landing way down at the end. Keep it up as long as you can without her freaking out. Keep pointing at that end point way down at the end of the runway and see how gently the wheels can touch down. That's one of the biggest secrets. If you can't stick a landing, and you that's probably it right there, is your attention is focused right out in front of you. And usually you'll bounce too hard, or you'll come in too hard. So if you constantly keep your gaze shifted down and aim for the end of the runway and just float down, you, you should have way more successful landings. And taking off is just as easy. She'll take off with the full flaps. She'll get up pretty quick. And again, it's classified as a sport plane, so it's meant for you to have fun. And just learn how to fly and enjoy flying. And doing touch and goes. Oops. A little aggressive, but, you know, learning how to do touch and goes and just play with the runway. Or, in this case, a taxiway. You spend all day kind of going up and down and keeping your eye downrange. There's the touch, and then we go. Learning how to fully use a rudder in a turn. Right now, I'm using mostly rudder, just leaning as you see, just kind of turning. But the power of the rudder in this thing is making the craft spin very very quickly in a very very short amount of space enough that you could just almost just turn down and go land on this runway or take the rudder, the rudder all the way to the other side kill the engine Fly around buildings, fly around boats. Quickly look and see if there's any water around. Probably not. Well, there should be actually. We're in Kuwait, right? So, I 
tank, get the flaps up. We can get some speed. So I, uh, the point of all this is I really recommend that if you want to get into flying and you're intimidated by any other aircraft because there's too many dials, too much weird crap going on and you want to just... Isn't there something easy? Yes, this is it. This is what you want. Practice and practice and practice with this and you'll have so much fun. And you'll have fun doing aero aerobatics and again, it's it's agile enough. Well, you might want to get there's a modification you can get for it which tunes it up and makes it even more sporty. And that's the one I'm currently running. It adds more horsepower to the engine, a little more responsiveness. And I actually think it should even be more responsive. But it's neither here nor there. Um, and once you're ready to move on, then I really recommend going to the Cessna line. 152 or the 172. With the old gauges like this, steam gauges, before you get into the, the digital stuff. The big highway system, corridor. Was close. Microsoft released a flight simulator many years ago called Flight. I wonder if these were bomb marks from previous campaigns. Something. I don't know. What are, I wonder what all these puck marks in the road are. Um. Where was that? Fired. Again, it will be really nice when we have high, uh, we have good photo maps of all the buildings. Than this to begin with. All right. So we pulled up the. Uh, oh, we pulled up the uh, gear. Also put down the rudder. Easy. Depending on the water is a little bit more difficult because there's no lines and no 
hard judging where you're at. That was nice. Okay. Plus, I have all the water waves at low. You also have a water rudder. Okay. So now that helps us when we're in boat mode. Turn. So now we're... I don't want to go too fast. Sorry. A little aggressive. Uh, yeah. Too aggressive right there. But, again, you get overconfident. Um, but, yeah. A flying boat car. That's super, super, super simple. Okay. That does it for me. It is... Yeah, it's midnight. Definitely the right time to wrap tonight's live stream up okay so tomorrow uh, you know what is tomorrow is tomorrow friday no tomorrow's only thursday well we'll be i will probably be ending it up tomorrow then back in babylon and deal with the end of the uh alexander the great story it's been a blast so far and i hope you tune in pardon the fact that i got started late i didn't get any um any cover art made for this and I'll get that fixed before the morning and get it all categorized properly yada 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 uh, and we're not starting soon I need this that one there Got some overlapping text. Can't seem to get rid of. But you do see at the bottom it says stream has ended. It is ended. And again, thank you for tuning in. Really appreciated it. Please like and subscribe. Sorry if it gets a little bit boring. Question, you know, give me any comments. Maybe help me out. Uh, you think I could be doing better? Or let me know, hey, I think you're doing this pretty good. Whatever. If you have any comments or constructive criticism, please, that'd be great. I'd appreciate it. Other than that, please like and subscribe. Uh, every penny counts in this economy and I could really use the help and I will see you back tomorrow for the next show yeah okay good night